This is Hannibal from the HannibalTV.com. And today we have a guest that has been requested for many years. I wanted to do this one in person, but unfortunately it hasn't worked out. So we got it on Skype. He's a 39 time WWE hardcore champion, two time ECW heavyweight champion, former NWA world champion, former WCW US lightweight and tag team champion among tons of other titles he's held he is known as johnny polo raven scotty the body tons of names we'll get into a bunch of them but he's best known as raven though how are you doing today sir i'll give you some applause ah thank you i heard you on another shoot interview say you like applause during your introductions <laughs> now i probably wasn't being serious but thank you anyway and there is a lot of shoot interviews of you I lied, but I had about 500 fan questions for you. Obviously, there's not going to be time for all of them. So we're going to be all over the place uh, asking sure. only fan questions today because I like to try and please the fans. I mean, you know what? The fans don't get enough credit, I don't think. Um, they're not like, I think people think they're not as smart as people think they are, but they're not as dumb either. You know, they're right in the middle. They're The average fan is right in the middle. Like, they're not like, what I mean by that is, you know, fans are always considered smizar. Do I need my head? I don't think I need these, do I? Let me see. Uh, I don't, I never notice any feedback when I don't wear them. Don't wear really them. Do. Really Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Because uh, they I, sometimes. I, 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 you might need them because now I hear myself on your end. Oh, okay. Then let me put them back on. The uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's weird. It's weird how the whole system feedbacks. Um, if uh, like it closes the loop on the system, even though you know it shouldn't make a difference if I'm wearing headphones, but it like uh, it, it completes the circuit because I got a microphone too, because you know for my podcast. So they say it works. The sound works better. But what I was saying is, like the fans that think they're smizart, that figure, think they can figure out every angle. They're not anywhere near as smart as they think they are, not to be denigrating to the fans, because by the same token, they're nowhere near as dumb as the boys think they are. Like the boys will do angles and then they'll like and then they they'll skip a step, you know, or a or a piece of it, or they won't have an idea for an outcome and it and it and they think, oh, don't worry about it. The fans are stupid. They they'll be fine with it. No, they're not fine with it. That's that's how you lose audience members. Um, but by the same token, you know, like when I went to when I first went to ECW. Um, you know, all the fans thought they knew every move that was going to be made, like, you know, and, uh, and so it was so easy to fool them because they, oh, I know what's coming next. So what well, we would do, whatever they expected. And then we would do it in the book, except there'd be a kick out then instead of the, you know, and so it, they're easy to fool, but they're also not fools. So, right. And there are, of course, a large percentage of, of developmentally disabled fans, but there's also lawyers and doctors, and then right. there's the ones in the middle. So they're all over the place. Yeah, they're they're yeah. It just I, I always get upset though when not upset. I just feel feel like the boys underestimate the fans way too much, and overestimate them by the same token, which is weird. True. Well, a lot of fans, since we're based in Canada, wanted me to ask you about your time in Al Tomko's Vancouver. <laughs> I'll tell you, I got to say, the Canadian fans are so loyal. It's crazy. Like, they, they, they know what they want. And they always, it seems like they're always getting shit on by the WWF. Like, they're always bringing up Montreal. You know, they're always you reference, like, you know, they're always, it, I don't know. I think the Canadian fans are, are like, you know, they're, they're the kind of fans you want to have everywhere. I mean, and I'm not trying to suck up to Canadian fans because I doubt I'll be in Canada in the next five years, you know, <laughs> the coronavirus, you know, the border's closed. But I'm just saying, but they're really good fans. They're like, like, I just, I know I'm not, I'm not answering a question, but we got two hours so I can just babble. But like Pittsburgh fans are the worst. Like they don't make any noise. Like I remember one time I was there and Kurt Angle was on top as a baby face in Pittsburgh. And the audience made so little noise. It's like, why do you even come to the show if you're not going to make any noise? You know, especially, I mean, Kurt Angle, like I, I can understand maybe they didn't want to pop for my match or the next match. But then you get the Kurt Angle on top as a baby face who's a local hero and they still sat on their hands. So Pittsburgh's shitty fans. Canada has good fans.
But Al Tomko, I'll get to Al Tomko now. Yeah, um, I left Florida Championship Wrestling, and uh, Al Tomko, I'd met him. Not Al Tomko, I met uh, Moose Morawski when I was in, on a tour of Hawaii that we did, and Moose wanted to bring me in. So when I finished up in Florida, then Moose, uh, they said, oh, we got a spot for you to go to in Vancouver working for Al Tomko, which I didn't even know there was an Al Tomko. Like, I didn't even know there was a, a Vancouver, BC wrestling. And uh, so I drove from uh, I drove from my house in West Palm Beach, Florida, all the way to Vancouver, Canada, which is like ridiculously long. And of course, John Tenta was there at that time, according to some reports I've read. Any memories of him? He wasn't there, I don't think. I was only okay. there a month. I was only there for one month. There was a fan that said they saw you on a show that John Tenta was also on, but that was a long time ago. So I think he was at a show. Like I think he was backstage. I met him. I think I met him once there, but I don't, I don't recall him working. Um, the, uh, yeah, I don't know. And for the Portland Territory, Billy Jack Haynes is a popular guest on this show. Did you ever cross paths with him in Portland? Yeah, I almost had to fight him one time. But uh, thank God we didn't have to fight. Um, me and Billy get along really well. Like, because Billy, I guess, is, you know, he's... I always got along well with the people who were, who got in trouble. Like, you know, like the, the people who were colored outside the lines. And, uh, and then one day, Art, Art Barr ribbed him. And blame and pinned it on me, and uh, and Billy Jack's like we got to talk, and I'm like, uh, no, no, I I forget exactly how it went, but but then I was so I had to go wrestle, and so I was shitting my pants wrestling because I had to wrestle, just trying to get through the match, trying to remember it because I knew I had to go talk, you know, fight, you know, possibly fight Billy Jack afterwards, and um, and then I got went up to him, I said, hey, listen, I said I didn't rib you, you know, I go, but. Look, if, if you want to fight, I'll fight you. I mean, you're going to kick my ass. I mean, that's obvious. But I, I will fight you just, you know, out of honor. But, I mean, I didn't do it. And and he believed me, and we were always good buddies after that. Was he really a, a cocaine dealer? Because he is self-professed. I'm that, sure he was. Yeah, you think so? Yeah, I, I, I would tend to believe the, the adventures he had. What about, uh, have you seen any of these videos that he alleges he was involved in the boys on the track murders in Arkansas? Uh, no, I haven't seen that. Okay. Now, you mentioned Art Barr. He's a pretty controversial character. What are your memories of him? I, I, li I liked Art a lot. Um, me and him really always got along, but there was always a little, like, uh, professional, anima like, not animosity, professional um, competition, you know, between us. But, but he, I mean, I don't know how, you know, Art, Art, Art was known for telling you what you wanted to hear. You know, he grew up in the business, but he did tell me that, uh, that he based a lot of the American love machine character on Scotty the body. Cause he always wanted to be a character like, you know, pretty boy, you know, chicken, uh, chicken shit heel with, but you know, womanizer kind of character like I did in, in Portland. And, uh, and so he always told me that, you know, whether it's true or not, you know, but, you know. I, uh, I, if it is, I'd, li I'd like to think it is. I'd, I'd like to hope it is. And, th and that's a great compliment from him, you know? I actually saw a clip of you on Twitter from Portland a couple weeks ago that a fan had uploaded of you. You may have seen it too, coming to yeah. the ring dancing with the girls. And I was actually impressed with your dancing ability. <laughs> yeah, I, I learned how to dance early because, like, white guys, black guys always dance with girls. But, you know, like when you're younger, White guys never want to dance with women. And so uh, women always have to dance with with each other. You know, I don't know how it is now because I don't go to the clubs now. But back, you know, when you're when I was, you know, 18 to 25, guys would never dance with women, you know, white guys. So I was like, I'm going to learn how to dance. I'll teach myself how to dance just so I can, you know, hook up with more women. <laughs> well, since you talk about that now, I'll probably get into it a few times during this. But you've been known as quite the pickup artist over the years. Uh, did that start at an early age or did you kind of gain your skills in that domain as time went on? I started I started that in high school um, and really I got good at it in, in college. Um, I mean, let's face it, if, if you're you don't even have to be good looking to pick up women, you just have to be charming. You know, I mean, if you're charming and personable and funny you know, or amusing at least, you know, but mainly if you're, if you're just, it's also confidence, you know, I had way, way more confidence than was deserved, but, 
<laughs> but that's, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah. Any tips for picking up in the gym? Um, well, now, I don't even know now. I mean, now it's such a different, you know, you know, with the Me Too movement, you know, it's now it's like, you know, women sometimes can be offended. I mean, I, I think they should be taken seriously. But I also think that, you know, if if a guy like a, sometimes women get mad when guys hit on them. But if the women had to hit on men, it'd be much harder. Like, you know, the, 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 all the onus is on us. It's on men to hit on women. or Otherwise, you know, there's no connection, you know, because women don't usually hit on men, or at least not in my generation. They didn't. So you don't know until you get turned down. Now, if you keep harassing the person afterwards, that's harassing. But if asking, but to be, to be, um, I don't know. It's it's really it's a tough. I would I would hate to be eighteen to thirty in this you know in this time frame between the coronavirus and the Me Too movement. And and I think that, and I'm glad there's a Me Too movement. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I think I've never understood how women could be treated less than equal or like. Or, or the Black Lives Matter. I can never understand why, like, why a black person or a woman should be paid less than anybody else is ridiculous. You know, everybody should have the same opportunities. You know, other than you know nepotism and stuff like that. But the, um, but I've never even, I, I couldn't even fathom that. So it's good that that's happening, but it's also it can it can be taken too far to the extreme, and and so it's got to go. It's you know, like I remember. Well, let me just say that, like, it goes, I, the way I see it is, is because things were so bad for their, for the situations for women, now it's gotten, gone so far, it's the pendulum swung the other way. And now it's got to swing back to the, to the where it should have been in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. And for Jimmy Jack Funk, I believe he was around the Portland uh, territory a little bit when you were there. Do you have any memories of him? Actually, I met him in well, my first territory was Memphis, and he was the like I my first my first match in Memphis was a TV match, and then my second match was and and I and I went I went four I was supposed to go four minutes and I went like a minute and a half forgot everything that I had ever learned about wrestling and just terrified and got through the match and they're like you only went a minute and a half and I'm like you're supposed to go four I'm like oh, yeah, blah, 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 you know and tried to cover up and then uh, that night though. I worked with Jimmy Jack Funk and I'm like, oh man, I, he's going to realize I'm terrible. He's not going to want to work with me. And it, and it was separate dressing rooms. So there's no way to communicate. All they give you is a finish. And then you go out there and you just make it up on that one year on the fly. And I'd only had like seven to nine matches before I even got to Memphis. So this was like my 10th match, my 11th match, maybe ever. And, um, uh, and we go out there and he's this big imposing guy. You know what I mean? He's been around for years. And I'm terrified. And uh, and then he starts squeezing. He has a wrist, lock, a wrist an arm, lock, an arm bar or a wrist lock. And he starts squeezing my wrist. And I look at him like, why are you squeezing my wrist? And then he squeezes it again. And I'm like, and he looks at me and I squeezes it again. And I'm like, maybe he wants me to reverse it. And I reversed it. And I remember seeing like him, like almost a smile came on his face. Like, you know, with, within the context of the character. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, now I'm starting to get this thing. You know, like not, not a clue. Still, I had no clue. But uh, he carried me to like a, a 10 minute Broadway and they go, wow, they, they thought I was really talented until my next night when I had to work uh, with these other guys and they were as bad as I was. And they're like, oh, you're terrible. And so my first so I became a, my, a jobber for my first cup two and two, three months in Memphis before I moved to Florida Championship Wrestling and started being used. People like to tell this story that supposedly Haku ripped out his eye and he only had one eye. I believe it say he's dead now, obviously he's still alive, but did he have one or two eyes when you were in there? No, no, no. What, what actually happened was from what I, from what I was told was he, he, the, the eye came out of its socket, but you can put oh. it back in. The eye can pop out of the socket and it's held on by veins and crap and stuff, I guess. And he put it back in his eye. So that's the, so, you know, so he had two eyes, but supposedly that's what happened. But I think I, I can't remember. If I asked him about that, or if I even, I don't think I even knew that back then, you know, that was my first territory, but the, uh, he may have told me that story anyway. I, I don't know. I mean, but it seems like I know from a reliable source that, you know, from pretty reliable that that probably happened. Now you mentioned Memphis, 
Jerry Jarrett's become really popular in recent years, a popular topic anyways, because of Bruce Pritchard making fun of him. What's your opinion of uh, Jerry Jarrett's mind for the business? Jerry's got an amazing mind for the business. He was so revolutionary, so ahead of the curve. You know, um, with, with TNA, I think the business has slightly passed them by, but he should have... He should have been used as a resource, though, I think. But Jeff and Jerry didn't get along at the time. So there's a lot of D stuff. But long story, my, my opinion of Jerry Jarrett, though, is the guy has a great mind for the business. I mean, he turned, like, when he was the booker in Memphis, he, um, they were selling out the Memphis Coliseum, 11,000 people every Monday night. And that's not a big market. Memphis is a small market, you know? I mean, they, they're doing something right, you know, between him and the king. And and to me, and what I say about the king is, I, I think of, of all the workers I've ever seen, the king's the best worker I've ever I've ever seen or been in a ring with ever. And I know you're being sincere there because I've heard you say that many times. You're always putting him over, and you're not the only legendary wrestler that puts him in that category. He's so he's really underrated for people who don't who've never been to Memphis or know in Memphis. You know, like back in the day. Like he could, he could talk people into the seats. He was a great baby face. He's a great heel. Like, you know, it just, he was so amazing. He was, he's as, he's as big as Hogan was everywhere in Memphis. He's bigger than Hogan was everywhere. You know, like, you know, comparatively or Austin, you know, he was that big. He was, they used to do a 60 share on TV. That's ridiculous. And for WCW, for your very first run there, how did the process go of you being recruited into that company? Um, so I left Portland Wrestling after two years there, and I and I moved to Atlanta because I figured that's where you know, WCW was, and that's where the you know hub of, of indie stuff was, and uh, and I figured I wasn't going to get into WWE because I was too small, so I figured WCW was my only was my hopeful you know goal, and. Um, but I fucked up when I was in Portland. They wanted to bring me into WCW and I didn't think I was ready. So I, I didn't go in and they took it as me being like, I'm too good for them. So then I had a bad reputation already. Um, and so then when I wanted to come in, when I thought I was ready for it, you know, I, I didn't realize that when opportunity knocks, you have to take it, whether you're ready or not. You can't just wait, you know, like I wanted to stay in Portland and stay in the, in the you know, in the, uh, in the lower in the uh, smaller leagues and get really good. So when I showed up, I'd be, you know, you know, ready to move to the, you know, to what I considered the, the, the highest positions on the card or as high as position as I could get, you know, what, what the highest position I could get on the card. But, uh, but so they thought I was a dick because I, 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 I totally did business the wrong way. And, uh, and I let somebody else take care of it for me and they didn't. And I learned a lesson from that. And uh, so DDP was a good friend of mine. We became good friends in Atlanta at the gym and he got Dusty to finally give me a tryout. And, uh, and then I, you know, I, but after two years in Portland, I knew all the tricks of the trade to make somebody look good, you know, how to bump, how to bump sell, how to, you know, how to make a squash match. Cause that's what it was. Basically somebody was just going to squash me, you know, to see how I looked or, you know, or, or a competitive squash match, I guess. Um, but I knew how to make, them look good how to make the other person look good how to make myself look good you know and and i because I, portland i spent two years working six nights a week minimum sometimes they were five nights but usually it was six and sometimes it was seven nights a week so you know i worked over 300 nights a year for two years i mean so i had 600 plus matches in two years um which now guys in the indies are lucky to have 600 matches in a career you know yeah but but uh, so you really learn how to work when you work every night with veterans, you know, because it was all guys who like it was Buddy Rose, Colonel De Beers, the grappler, the grapplers who I really learned how to work and book from. He was a brilliant guy. Um, but, you know, Al Madrill. Uh, so there, there was all it was either guys on the way up or guys on the way down. And uh, and so you really if you if you were smart, you could pick somebody's brain, you would learn how to work. And so. Um, so I got to try out. So anyway, so I got to try out and I pulled all the stops out and Dusty hired me and, and man, he had big plans for me too. Like, 
like uh, he was tell he was telling me the plans he had, and DDP was in the room, you know, sitting at the table with us. And DDP's kicking me under the table as Dusty tells me all the plans he has, and like he's kicking me so hard that like I'm like I'm trying not to sell it. <laughs> and uh, but then Bill Watts came in, and Bill Watts didn't like me, so because Bill Watts didn't like chicken shit heels, you know, he's all into tough guys, and so he gave me the heave ho, even though I helped train his son Eric, which is bullshit, but whatever. Anyway, he gave me the heave ho. And then I was back to Memphis, which was like the Hotel California. You could check out, but you can't ever leave. Back there when Eric had his little skirmish with Rick Rude. Uh, what skirmish with Rick Rude? Supposedly they had like an amateur wrestling match in the locker room. And supposedly Eric got the better of Rick Rude. I don't think I'm I was there for that. I don't think okay. I was there for that. But I was there when Rude uh, got in a fight after a show. Uh, me, I was riding with him, Nash, and Spivey, and uh, and it was it was really like he was beat. This guy started shit with him, and then Rude had to like suplex the guy onto like a hill off a hill, and then went sliding, it went sliding down the hill. It was really funny, but you know, but it was like it was like a comedy of errors kind of fight. But Rude was killing the guy, you know, but it just it just it just it was more comical than anything watching it because they're they're fighting in like a, on a sandy hill and it, like nobody can get any traction. <laughs> ridiculous. How did they end up on the hill? That's where we, that's where the cars were parked. It was like on the side of it, like on a little bit of a hill, like you know, and you walk down the hill to get to the arena. Okay. Did Rick Rude uh, give you any advice in the business when you were back there? No, not really. Um, uh, he used to call me Flaming for short for Flamingo. And uh, one time we were at uh, we were in, in London, and we uh, and and it was weird. It was right when um, the uh, that movie came out with the transvestite. Uh, the the guy falls in love. What was it? It was like a big um, where the uh, the guy was a where the guy was a where the guy's dating her, and he thought he was dating a man a woman, but it was really a man. The okay, crying I game. The crying I... game. Yeah, it was a big. It was a huge movie. Anyway, so. The, uh, we're in England and we're at uh, this club, the Hippodrome, and these two gorgeous chicks start hitting on us. And then, uh, so we're, we're, as we're getting ready to walk out the door with them, the bartender calls us over and he goes, Hey, he goes, they've had it lopped off. I'm like, We're like, What? They go, They've had their penises lopped off. I'm like, Okay. And so <laughs> so we, we, we changed our minds. We weren't, we weren't very woke back then. Now, for uh, Steve Austin, I heard you on his podcast. He recently re-uploaded one of your uh, episodes. You guys seem like you were very close in WCW. How did you guys end up gravitating towards each other? Um, how do we have that? We, we rode together. Um, um, we, just, we just clicked. We just got along, I guess, because um, comedy, we both, you know, and music and and me, him, and Pillman used to ride together, so uh, we we just got along really, really well. And um, and then like uh, we had hoped, like me and Pillman had hoped to be a tag team because you know because at our since we were smaller guys, we weren't going to get the kind of push and make the the real money, you know. Because um, and I was only two twenty then, um, and uh, which is which was small then. And Pillman was you know Pillman size, and so we wanted to be a tag team. And Austin, you know, and Austin was the U.S. champ or whatever. And then uh, Watts came in and Watts uh, made, decided to make those two guys a tag team, get, got rid of me. And uh, so, you know, it happens, whatever. Steve usually will put down his stunning Steve Austin gimmick from those days. What did you think of it? Uh, he, was, he was just talented. I mean, he just knew, like, he was just so talented on that you knew, like, he was a star, you know. So you eventually ended up in WWE. Who recruited you to there after your WCW run ended? After WCW, I went uh, back to Memphis. And, in, and when I was in Memphis, they had like an exchange deal with WWE. So WWE came calling and maybe Johnny Polo. But I never, I never thought that that was me at all. Like, I thought that, was Sh that should have been Shane McMahon. He should have been Johnny Polo because that would have been the perfect character for him. But on the other hand... I actually you know, became a legitimate member of the Mean Street Posse in real life because the Mean Street Posse were really Shane, Shane's best friends. Like, did he grow up with Pete Gaz and Joey Abs and uh, and Rodney? 
And uh, and uh, since I lived, since, uh, since when they brought me into WWE, WWF at the time, they made me a producer, Monday uh, associate producer, Monday Night Raw, and um, they uh, so I had to move there, and uh, and so I became really good friends with them. And so I was, so I always say that I'm a, I'm an actual member of the Mean Street Posse. Now, did they like as soon as they hire you? That was part of the deal. You were also going to be a producer the entire time. No, what happened was, is uh, Lawler took some time off, and so Vince brought me in as a commentator to work with him, and then he really liked the fact that I came prepared. I had, you know, it was clever creative i had you know bits that i brought i was like hey you know vince if i say this you know if you say this i can say this and uh and he likes that um and he likes uh, prepared you know people who prepare and do their homework and um and so they uh they said we're gonna make you an associate producer of raw i was like all right you know so i got paid six figures and uh got a and then uh got an office on the fourth floor of titan tower to executive floor and uh, my office is right across from Pat and Bruce's, but uh, but it was not what I wanted to do. Um, and as soon as they took me off TV for, as a manager, um, that's when I um, we knew it was time to quit. And because I didn't want to, I didn't want to. I got into business to wrestle, you know. So I knew I had to reinvent myself, and and that's when uh, I came up with Raven, and uh, and changed my career, changed my luck. We've heard some people like Vince Russo say that Bruce Pritchard can be a pain to deal with behind the scenes, kind of being a real politician. Did you experience any of that or were, were you on good yeah. terms with him? No, Bruce hated me. Him and Pat did not like me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm 55 years old. I'm not going to get in a pissing contest now. But, you know, I just as I face to say that he didn't like me and we didn't get along. And, uh and I don't think you, uh, I, mean, I definitely don't think my best interests were at his heart. You know what I mean? Uh, but, um, and also they were grooming me to be, uh, cause I was also writing a second run TV, the all American Amania shows. And they were grooming me to be on the book, <clears throat> grooming me to be on the booking committee, which was Pat and Bruce. You know, there's no booking committee like there is, you know, now there's no writers. It was just, you know, it was just, uh, Pat and Bruce, you know, same with every company. It was just a booker. And uh, they were grooming me to be with, work with Pat and Bruce, and I'm sure they didn't like that, and they didn't like me, so it just compounded things. So, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, whatever. I, I haven't talked to Bruce in a long time, you know. I mean, I, I don't hold any grudges, so yeah, you know, I don't care, you know. And and so I don't. And I heard I heard he said some nice things about me, so I'm not going to just you know rag on him for no reason. You know what I mean? And we've heard some stories about this Lisa, Lisa Wolf from <laughs> Al Snow and J.J. Dillon. I guess she worked at the office around that time. Did you have any experiences with her? Yeah, she was in charge of human human resources. And her, her I was her pet project. Like, they told her to turn me into a mensch, basically. You know, because I'd show up in, in, like, Raven. I'd show up in Raven clothes. And, uh, and they said, no, we got to have you in a suit and tie. You got to be corporate. You know, so they... They had me start wearing a suit and tie and she was in charge of, you know, getting me to be, you know, more uh, corporate as opposed to, you know, who I am, which is not corporate. What was Shane's job in those days behind the scenes? I, I'm not a remember. I forget. But but the funny thing was, is I used to get so much heat, like with the like all the boys thought I was because me and Shane hung out that I was that I was sucking up to the boss's son. But in actuality, I was getting, I was burying myself because Shane would always go out. I'd always bring him out with me and we'd go out till five in the morning and then he'd call his dad and he, uh, and, and because on TV, like I always loved this comedy bit where you call the guy by the wrong name. So I would call Vince Vic on TV. I'd go, Hey Vic. And he goes, Vince. And I'm like, Oh, sorry, Vic. And then, uh, so Shane was started calling his dad, Vic, which did not help my career any. And then Shane goes, <laughs> And then Shane would be like at five in the morning. He's like, hey, dad. Hey, he goes, hey, Vic, I'm staying at Johnny Polo's tonight, which was just burying me. I'm like, oh, you're killing me. Don't call your dad Vic when you're hanging out with me, you know. And, you know, he, well, he just thought it was funny. But, you know, but also they didn't like their son being out till five in the morning, hanging, you know, getting hanging out with, with me who was drunk on every night, you know. So the uh, so it, it, it buried me. It didn't have the uh, 
would be, it, it did not help my career one iota and probably negatively impacted hugely, even though I got heat from the boys from being, you know, for exact opposite. We always hear that it's likely going to be Triple H possibly taking over from Vince if he ever passes or steps down. Do you think Shane would have been the better person because he seems more cool, for lack of another word, than Triple H and Stephanie? They don't seem to be doing anything too great right now with uh, Triple H running NXT Creative. Well, it's funny. Uh, Shane was always groomed for it. Shane always was like, you know, back then he used to be like, me and you are going to be the Pat and Bruce in the 90s, you know? And I was like, yeah, I'm like, oh, I'd be great, you know? But um, but I think, um, I don't know. I mean, I really, I, I've, I haven't talked to Shane in years. Um, and uh, But I, I know Hunter knows wrestling. I mean, let's face it, Hunter knows the business really, really well, you know? Um, do I watch the show? No. But do I keep up with it? I keep up with it to an extent, you know, so I got an idea what goes on. I don't necessarily agree with all the, all the stuff they do, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that, uh, of what the, because I don't know, I don't know those guys in 10 years, you know what I mean? Or no, 20 years. I haven't, I don't really, know, I haven't seen those guys in 20 years. So, you know, but 20 years ago, I would say a hunter was much more uh, qualified because, he uh he knew he understands wrestling at, at a really at a really deep level you know and you really have to, to be a good booker um but uh and I don't really know how Shane would be so I mean it's it's you know you'd think it'd be easy for me to make to pick but I, I really don't know I don't know them I mean I haven't seen them in 20 years is there anything that you're particularly proud of producing during those days working in the office um the um, I came up with an idea mainly because I wanted to watch old wrestling tapes where I where I came up with this uh, flashback segment for the, one of the shows I was writing, the uh, All American, and um, so which meant that I had to go find old matches to show. And but you couldn't show matches that had WCW talent. You couldn't show matches that had guys who were um, who were on persona non grata. You couldn't show matches with. So it was really hard to find matches, but I didn't care because I just got to watch through tapes. So, I mean, I remember sitting in the, in the studio watching Dusty Rhodes versus superstar Billy Graham from Madison Square Garden, you know, and stuff like that. It was really cool to watch those matches. So I'm proud I got that on the air. But, I mean, it, it was tough, though, to find, uh, you know, to find stuff that had guys that you could put on there, that you could air. And then also a lot of also, also matches back then were mostly squash matches. So the only stuff you could really find was the Madison Square Garden stuff. And then, but back then, guys worked the crowd way more than they worked the crowd now, you know, like to the point where if you watched it now, you'd be like, oh my God, this is taking forever. But the crowds were so lively that, you know, especially, you know, the main events I was watching, you know, it, like it, it was, it was very hard to find matches you could put on the air. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, speaking of superstar Billy Graham, I mean, he's described it as pandemonium when he walked out as champion, and you can see the crowd going wild. Do you ever think there will be pandemonium like that again for wrestling crowds? Uh, only if they give out free pandas. <laughs> and how was working with uh, Gorilla Monsoon? You did some announcing with him. Yeah, I love doing that. Guy, Gorilla was such a great guy. He was so... Uh... Such a nice guy, too. Just a nice gentleman, you know. Just a really, really smart guy, you know. Now, I actually liked the Johnny Polo character when I was a kid. I didn't understand that you were the same guy from WCW. I remember seeing you. Re I'm from Ottawa. I saw you wrestle Owen Hart once on a house show here in Ottawa. And I couldn't understand why you were wrestling because I thought you were just the manager but how did they present the Johnny Polo idea to you uh, when you came in? They said, you're going to be this rich kid from Connecticut, this, this upper crust rich kid, which I'm thinking immediately, like my voice pattern does not sound like an upper crust rich kid. I sound like a, you know, a thug, um, you know, or a bum. Um, and they said, uh, and you're going to manage uh, Adam bomb. Cause he was new and they wanted, and they wanted a contrast, but, I just, I never saw it. I mean, but 
and, and you know, they never, and to, to be honest, eventually that's why Vince took, stopped me managing because he's like, it's like, there's a disconnect. He goes, when I see you, I don't really see a Johnny Polo like this upper crust rich kid. I go, I know I never saw it, but I wasn't going to tell you that when, when you're hiring me, you know, when you're first hiring me, cause I needed the job, you know, but, uh, yeah. You were funny uh, though, is that character. The best well, you know, part was how funny you were. Well, people think, people think that I hated that character and it's not that I hated it. I loved what I did. I just didn't like being the character, but the work I did, I'm very proud of the work I did. Like, you know, like the one time I came out with the flippers on and a, and a snorkel and a, and a mask, like, you know, like a man of leisure. That's what I, that's the whole concept was. I tried to make him more a man of leisure, you know, who has all this money. So, he, you know, he gets to, and, and I came out with, um, with a blue drink and a giant mug and a, and a lawn chair. And I actually taped a umbrella into the drink to the side of the drink. So I had an umbrella drink and I was like, you know, I was proud of what I was doing, but it's not what I wanted to do or who I wanted to be, you know? And, uh, and I didn't want to manage, I wanted to wrestle, but you know, I figured as long as I'm managing, it's, I'm still, you know, working. But if I take, if I, if I become just a full-time producer and now I'm at, now I'm not even working at all. And, and that wouldn't, that didn't work for me. Was it common for them to do that, to throw you into house show matches? Like the one I saw with kind of no explanation as to why you're suddenly a wrestler. Uh, I, yeah, and, and I didn't. I didn't work excessive amounts, but I worked enough. Like, like one of the things I'm proudest of is I got the people to chant a uh, Virgil chant when I wrestled Virgil. Like, I felt like, you know, the fact that I got them to hate me enough that they would cheer, go Virgil, go. I was pretty proud of that. Now, for Adam Baum, have you heard about his recent arrests and all the stuff going on with him? Not, not, not a recent update. Yeah, I, I heard about it. Was, he got arrested for bank robbing or something or... It was something fairly serious. I don't think it's actually gone to uh, to trial yet, but obviously, I guess you don't know that much detail about it. You probably don't stay in contact with him. No, I don't stay in contact with. I stay in contact with very few people, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm just not a phone person, you know. Like, you know, like I'll text certain people like every three, four months, you know, or every month. But uh, but I'm like, I'll see him when I see him, you know. Now, I've interviewed both Quebecers a couple of times. Carl Ouellette said he liked you, but for some reason, I guess, Jacques didn't go into it, but I guess for some reason, you didn't mix that well with Jacques. I guess you didn't ride with them or something. Yeah, I, yeah, I rode with Marty Gennetti. Um, the, uh, me and Marty, I known him from my first territory in Memphis, and uh, me and Marty always really got along well. And... Uh, and plus, I don't think they ever asked. I don't know if they ever even asked. They might have asked me to ride with them. But yeah, me and Pierre get along great. But Jock just never liked me, you know. Or I don't know if he ever. I, maybe he did at one point. I don't know. Jock. Um. But uh. But but you know, Jock was a uh, Jock was talented. You know, I got nothing bad to say about him. I mean, he did nothing bad to me. You know, he never. You know, he may not have liked me, but he wasn't. He didn't show it. Like you know, he didn't. He didn't act like he didn't like me. So to me, he was always friendly. So you know. They were telling me about some heat they had backstage with the Steiners. Uh, did you notice any of that at that time? Or since you didn't really ride with them, were you kind of out of the loop there? Kind of out of the loop. Plus, um, I didn't really know they had heat with them. Um, but uh, but I threw an apple at Rick once. And, and I guess the apple just burst on a pole and luckily didn't hit Rick in the face. But I guess it almost came to blows that day. Really? Yeah. I didn't even know that happened. The, it was um, on a European tour. I might not have been. Uh, I might not have been on that. I might have been producing. Like they might have left me behind. Yeah, I don't think I went on the European tours, Johnny Polo. I don't think I went on any overseas stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I get along really well with Rick too. Like uh, um, I used to always go. Like, uh, they used to do those face-to-face -face promos where you're in, like, you know, where there's a curtain between you, but really you're supposed to be separated from different parts of the country. And I would always, like, Rick would say his promo, and then I'd, then I'd make fun of him, stick my head around the curtain and make fun of him, and then he'd chase me around the locker room. <laughs> but, uh, but thank God he never beat me up, though. <laughs> like, even in play, even in play, I wouldn't want to be beat up by Rick. No. <laughs> now, for Ludwig Borga, strangely... 
I had a bunch of fans that wanted me to ask you about Ludwig Borga. So there's for some reason interest in your opinion of him. Um, you know, he supposedly he was a Nazi. You know, he hated Jews and supposedly, but he he, he never treated me poorly. I mean, I guess because I was friends with Nash, so I you know so you know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the guy at all. Barely. You know, I've ridden with him, I think, once or twice because I was riding with Kevin. And uh, but I mean, yeah, you know, just yeah, I mean, I could I don't know. I, I don't know him well enough. I hate that. I hate to sound like I'm copping out, but I just don't yeah. know the guy that well. But, you know, and, and I always go by how people treat me. You know, I mean, that's all you can go by, you know, like, um, you know. One of the stories that the Quebecers had told me was that apparently the Steiners popped Borga's tires and tried to blame it on Jacques and, and Carl, but it, it all ended up getting settled down. But as you said, you don't know anything about that. Um, Bastian Booger, I heard that you found that he wasn't too nice of a person. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, uh, Booger, Bastian Booger, he, man, he, um, he was funny, though. He was fucking funny as hell, but he, uh, but it was always insult humor, which I, I, I like, I like insult humor, you know, but, uh, but no, I don't think he liked me either. I don't think he liked me very much, but, um, yeah, no, that's, that's, I mean, I don't know much to say. I didn't hang out with these guys, so I don't have much to say about him, you know? Now, what about the undertaker? Did you have much interaction with him? We, we hung out a, just a teeniest bit. We, uh. We went to a Blackfoot concert once. Me, him, and uh, I, I was. Uh, he was in town in Stanford, and um, and I was producing. I was going to see Blackfoot that night, so I said, "You want to go?" He's like, "Yeah." So him and Bruce Pritchard, we all went to see Blackfoot. Um, and then uh, and then one time I rode with him, and we we went to the mystery the mystery uh, what's it the mystery that the no the Winchester House the Winchester Mystery House with all oh. the rooms. That was crazy, man. So me, him, and Paul Bear all went there one day on a day off. Like we either had a day off or before the show, we went to the mystery uh, Winchester Mystery House. That was our that was our big adventure together. Wow, any memories of that? No, just just it was like you know, it's one of those things where if ever we see each other, like we're like ah, oh, the mystery Winchester House. You know, like you know, like you have to like. One time I rode with Jim Duggan. Like I only rode with him once in, a, in all the years in the business. I rode with him on one loop and we went to see um, and we went to see two movies on two different days. We we're in Texas somewhere and uh, we saw uh, basketball and something about Mary. And so whenever we see each other, we always bring that up because, you know, it's like a touchstone, you know. I'm you know? shocked that uh, Raven would go to see basketball. <laughs> Basketball was hysterical. It was, I thought it was so much better than there's something about Mary. Like there's something about Mary got all the hype because she had to come in her hair. Yeah. But basketball was a way funnier movie. Like I, those guys are hysterical, the South Park guys. So how did you put together the whole Raven character and come up with the name and so forth? Uh, the uh, I I knew I, I wanted to still be a chicken shit character, but Paige DDP. Um, goes to me, he said, you need to be more, you need to go, you need to be, you can't be a chicken shit anymore. I'm like, why? He goes, because nobody's hiring them because nobody, that's not the way the bookers are looking for. I go, but it's a money drawn character. I can be a money drawn character. He goes, yeah, but it doesn't matter what you think. It matters what they think. I'm like, that's a good point. So he goes, uh, he goes, I was watching the, um, point break the other day and I saw, and those red hot chili pepper guys, you remind me of them, you know, cause you have tattoos with the long hair and the leather jacket. And he's like, you ought to, you ought to do something like that. So that's what, it, that's the, that was the impetus. So, and then from there, um, I created the whole character lock, stock and barrel, you know, like I created the, the wardrobe, the promos, the look, everything. But, but I, but I totally give Paige credit for pointing me in the right direction, you know? And, and that's also why Raven was so tough was because he had to, he had to be overcome the albatross of Johnny Polo. You know, so I had to become the toughest guy in the business. And I didn't want to be a tough guy. I mean, like, you know, I'm reason. I mean, we're all reasonably tough back in our real world. But in the wrestling world, there's tough guys. I mean, there's levels, you know, and I didn't want to play a tough guy because in, in the wrestling world, I'm not anywhere on that. You know, I'm, I'm in a much lower level than most people, you know. 
even though I was a U.S. Marine, um, even though I've been in enough fights and I can handle myself, but I didn't, I didn't want to just, it, to me, being a tough guy is kind of blasé, you know, just being a uh, just tough guy, you know what I mean? Like anybody, anybody can do it. There's no art form. So I had to make it, I wanted to make mine an art form. I wanted to make my character three dimensional. I wanted to make mine unique. Um, and also I knew, which everybody should know, but they don't, is that selling, if you get beat up, if you're getting beat up and you take everybody's finishes and you keep getting up, you're the toughest guy in the room. Not the guy who does the beating up. Everybody thinks it's the guy who beats people up is the toughest guy. No, the toughest guy is the guy that takes the beating and then gets up and says, what up, motherfucker? And so that's why I took Raven, because I mean, I wanted to make him a more interesting tough guy. Um, where it wasn't about being so tough, he just happened to, to enjoy pain and to, and to be able to take a beating. Um, and plus, I love selling. Like To me, selling is the, is the most entertaining part of wrestling. There's, there, to me, there's nothing more entertaining than watching a guy sell trying to stand up and you're like, is he going to stand up? Is he going to be able to get up and fight back? Is he going to be able, is he going to fall over? You know, the drama. And so I, uh, and I, and I sell well, I sell really well. It's what I do best. So I knew that I wanted to do that. And I knew I wanted to, um, I knew I was going to do something alternative because it fit my, you know, my look. Cause I always wore Doc Martens anyway. I wore leather jackets, um, jean, ripped up jeans, you know? So, I started thinking, how do I, I gonna, what do I do? Okay. What, what do I, how do I make this character? I go, all right, I need a, I need a look. So I go, I've told this story a bunch of times before, but I'll tell it again. Um, so I go, I need, uh, I need some shorts. I'm I don't want to wear wrestling gear because that's not, it's going to take my, it's not going to define the character the way he needs to be defined. So I'm going to wear, so first I got some gym, some baggy ass gym short types, you know, I'm like, nah, I need jeans, jean shorts. Ripped up jean shorts. So I pulled a pair out of my closet. I'm like, all right, that's perfect. So then I go, um, now I need need some flannel, you know, because grunge was big then. So I'm like, oh, I'll go get some flannel. So I got a flannel, put on a flannel shirt, cut off the sleeves. But I look like Big Josh then. Remember Matt Bourne's yeah. character? So I was like, that's not it. So I found another flannel shirt that I had and I tied it around my waist because I'd already cut the sleeves off the other one. <laughs> and so I got another flannel shirt. So I tied it around my waist. I'm like, all right, that works. Um, then I, um, then I said, I put, I got to I go, where my Doc Martens, I'll have a wrestling soul put on it, take, you know, for my Doc Martens. So then I got them and then, um, and then I need a, I need a jacket. Do I wear a jean jacket? No, leather jacket. Yeah. I'm going to just wear my leather jacket. And then I realized that like, I've always been a big fan of ring jackets. Like, cause to me, to be a star, you got to look like a star. And so you want to have a lot of ring jackets. Like. I always, I always use Terry Taylor as an example. Like Ric Flair had like so many robes that were beautiful. So he looked like a million bucks. Terry Taylor had one robe that was beautiful. It looked like a Ric Flair robe. You know, it was as good as that or better, except he only had one. So when he wore it, oh, it's really cool. And he wears it again and again. And all of a sudden you're like, that's the same jacket. It doesn't, it, you lose luster. You know what I mean? It was a brilliant jacket though. And it was expensive. So I don't blame him. You know, but I, I think you have to spend money to make money. So I like when I was in Portland, I had 12 ring jackets and I only been in the business a year and a half at that point, you know, because I knew that's important to look like a star. And uh, and I'd make them on the cheap. I would uh, I'd go to TJ Maxx and buy like a, a leather jacket or a jean jacket for 20 bucks back in Portland. And then I find some um, some fr I put some fringe on it or a patch on the back with a um like uh, something cool, or I'd put like neon pads, you know, patches on it. To, you know, and I'd buy the really weird looking jean jackets too. So they would look unique on their own. And so I had like 12 ring jackets and none of them cost me more than 50 bucks to make, you know, so, but then I knew I couldn't wear any of that now. So I uh, wear a leather jacket. So I'm like, if I just wear a little one leather jacket, it's not going to have as much star power, but he wouldn't wear anything else. So what else would he wear? He'd wear a concert shirt. That's what he, so I'd got concert shirts and then I cut the sleeves off because I had big arms. It also, I have a thick waist. So it hit my thick waist and hit my lack of chest. So it was, so it hit my weaknesses and accentuated my strengths. So I was like, all right, I got the outfit. And then in, in the same five, in the same five to eight minutes that this happened, I go, I need a name, I need a name. But let's see who, okay. Who would I, who would I use as a reference point? The crow. What was his name? Uh, 
Draven, Eric Draven, Draven, Raven. Quote the Raven, nevermore. Boom. Now I had the whole, uh, I had the whole thing. Now I just had to work on the promos. So I'd, uh, I'd write some promos. I'd call a page. I'm like, how's that? He's like, ah, no, nah, that's not it. And I'd call him back. How about this? Ah. And then eventually I got the gist of it. But I still didn't see where I was going with it yet. Like, so, so then um, I got the job. Paulie hires me. And, uh, and so he thought it was going to do like, um, like a, a, a rock and roll grunge version of, like, of what I'd been doing, like a comedy character. But when he saw what I was doing, he really got vibed with it. And, uh, and he really kind of understood, like subconsciously, I, I was headed somewhere, like to, to mining my, my, my neuroses and my dark past and mining that for material. And he saw I was going that way way before I did. Like in the first month or two, he understood my character better than I did. You know, I didn't I didn't understand what I was coming up with at first because I was I was blocking it. You know what I mean? Like I was I was hiding from what I was trying to accomplish mentally, to you know, because I was mining my own shit for it. And then eventually I figured out what I was doing. And then I really got a handle on it. And then I just, uh, and then I just did the best work I've done. The best work I've ever done in my career has been with Pauly. You know, just, we worked so well together, even though I drove him nuts. How was the pay working there? What you expect. <laughs> oh, God. Now everyone remembers those chair shots at, at Heat Wave from Dreamer. Did you guys put that, uh, that little segment together? The, uh, which one? When you took those uh, chair shots, I think it was Heat Wave '95. The the one that uh, the one chair shot, the chair shot heard around the world in the opening. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, he, okay. So I I had chaired him a numerous times. So him and Paulie wanted to hit me like ten times a piece. I didn't know that was Heat Wave '95. I didn't know what it was. And um, so Paulie's like, "We got to hit you ten times." I'm like, "No, you don't." And Dreamer's like, "No, I got to to get my revenge." I'm like, "No, you hit me once." It stands out. I'll sell it like I've been shot. I go, but if you hit me 10 times, they're not going to mean anything. You know, he goes, but everybody else in the card is taking three, four chair shots. I'm like, they can take three, four. It doesn't matter what they do. My match, what happens in mine, it doesn't matter. As Piper smart me up this a long time ago. It doesn't matter what anybody else does in their match. You want to convince them that yours is real. And that's great advice. Like, doesn't matter if every other match is fake, you know, to the fans. But if your but if your match looks real, the people go, I saw that match. That was real. You know what I mean? Or that's the closest you can come to. You know, it doesn't matter. Like if the if the guy right before you takes thirty seven chair shots, right, and then you go out there. If you take one and sell it, who's gonna a who's gonna get over more and b are they gonna go? Uh, they're just gonna say the thirty seven chair shots were phony. They're not gonna think the one chair shot. You know. So I took the one. So then I finally convinced Dreamer, and Dreamer was amazing. Like. I would, I would, if I had an idea and I was and I was set on it, he would always he would always go, all right, I'm buying it, I'm trusting you, I'll I'll totally go your way. And I go, but I always when I was wrong, though, I'd always admit I was wrong. Like if afterwards I was wrong, I'd go, okay, I was wrong, sorry about that. And he knew I would admit it, you know. So he had no problem. So Paulie, we had then we had to convince Paulie for me to just take the one chair shot, and then it became you know legendary, supposedly, you know, in the open, it got fit in the opening, you know, amazingly. I can ever get there's two there's two compliments that that people that uh, that I think are the best that people can ever give me and one is that they got into the business because of me that's the greatest compliment and then the other is is when people say when when friends of workers go is Raven really an asshole and that to me is the greatest compliment because that means they believe that, that I they believe the shit I was doing out there to some extent because they believe I'm an asshole, you know, now, whether I was an asshole or not, that's debatable, you know, well, not very debatable. I was an asshole, but that's beside the point. But the fact that they thought that, um, that to me means I'm doing my job. And so not that I expected people to believe that me and dreamers feud is real, but I, but I wanted them to believe that the animosity was real. I wanted them to believe that, you know, that I was really this big a prick this really just selfish, childish, tortured, poetic soul. Um, and that me and Dreamer, you know, because and and it, they have to be able to suspend disbelief in the moment. Like, um, yeah. So it's not that they it's not that people think it's real. 
but it's that in a while they're watching it, they go, wow, this is like, they, they're not, they're not busy going, let's go so-and-so let's go so-and-so. Cause that's, that's more of an athletic contest. That's not a fight. I wanted them to go uh, kill Raven, kill Raven or go Tommy, go Tommy. And, and even that breaking down, I wanted them to yell, kill Raven more than I wanted them to yell, go Tommy. Like, you know, because if they're yelling, fuck you, Raven, that means they hate me more than they love him. And if they're yelling, go Tommy, that means they love him more than they hate me. And so I would never do anything to, to try and, you know, I would never, I would never do anything to try and to get over on some, on, on, on an opponent in any way that I didn't tell them ahead of time. You know I mean? I would never try and make myself, you know, take liberties or, you know, with, with, you know, or, you know, make, do stuff to, to make the him look lesser. I would never do that because to me, it's a dance. It's a partnership. But by the same token, I wanted people to yell, fuck you, Raven, not go Tommy. But either one was still better. It was still what I wanted because that means that they're emotionally invested, which is the key. When they're yelling, let's go so-and-so, let's go the other guy, they're emotionally invested and that's great to hear. But it's not as great as go so-and-so and and fuck you so-and-so because that means they're emotionally invested so deeply. Whereas the other way, they're, they're being, they're excited, they're loving the match but they realize it's just a match. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. And a couple of fans wanted me to ask you about the Sandman overdose story. <laughs> yeah. So it's the first time Rhino rode with us. So Rhino, so Rhino's driving. I'm in the passenger seat in the front in the back is Sandman and, and Fonzie and little Guido's back there. And so, um, I was shooting up, uh, Oxycontin at the time. Um, not proud of it, but it, it is what it is. Um, and that's why I like on my podcast, uh, whenever I tell, you know, stories about my past, I always include, I mean, even, even if I don't, I always include a number for addiction hotline and, uh, and an addiction and recovery.org where you can get, you know, find information. Cause you know, cause I still believe that I, I, I so wish I wouldn't have done the amount and quantity that I did, but I did. There's nothing I can do about it. And I did have some great times. I also had some horrible times. And so I always try to try to point out the negative with the positive, because otherwise it just, you know, it just glorifies the positive and people don't realize, you know, like my heroes were drug addicts, you know, which is stupid, really stupid, you know, and I don't want people to, 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 to feel the same way about me going, yeah, Raven got fucked up. I'm going to get fucked up unless they know that that getting fucked up means paying a price, you know, and a big price. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we're, we're driving and, uh, and I was shooting a boxy cotton. So we go in the bathroom and find, and, and Sandman's like, he's like, uh, at a gas station bathroom and he's like, um, let me try something. I go, all right, but don't do that. You can't do that big a dose. You know, you haven't, your, your system isn't adapted to it because you haven't done, you know, whatever, you know, you build up to a tolerance and your tolerance is way lower. So he's like, no, nah, I'm fine. I can do it. So he does it. Next thing I know, we're driving down the highway and Fonzie goes, bend it up, daddy. Sandman's lips are turning blue. We're like, holy shit. I'm like, fucking call 911. So we call 911 and, uh, and uh, they go, what? Are, where are you at? We're in the we're in the highway. They go, meet us at mile marker so and so. We'll be at the gas station at the off the exit. So we go so hauling ass, and we're like, what do we do we, with all the baggage? We got drugs in there. Well, we don't want to get arrested. Well, we got to make sure we save Sandman's life. So we so we get off the exit. We race to the exit. Got off. There was a hotel right across the street from the gas station. So we jump out at the hotel. We throw all the luggage out. Little Guido's in the way back. He goes flying, body surfing over the luggage and takes a face plant on the <laughs> fucking cement. <laughs> we get all the bags out of the car and then we, we leave Guido with him. And then we drive over across the street to the gas station. 911's there. The paramedics are there. And uh, Sandman always likes to say that they had to stick a needle in his heart to restart it. But that didn't actually happen, though. But they had to give him some Narcan, I guess. And they, uh, they got his heart restarted. And his wife was so pissed at me. Oh, I'm like, it's not my fault. I can't control him. I go, but uh, but yeah, Sandman almost died. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Did and you we, still make Rhino, the show? Yeah, we still made the show. Yeah, we, no, this was after the show, I think. This is after okay. the show. And Rhino, this is his first time riding with us ever. <laughs> and he's new to the company, too. So he's like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? <laughs> he's a pretty straight guy, I guess. 
Yeah, no, Rhino's a really good guy, yeah. And as far as uh, Mike Awesome, what's your opinion on him? I think that uh, he was a really good guy. I mean, I didn't know him that well. You know, I think we were in the tag belts one time or something, but we never really hung out other than, other than I always thought it was his idea to wear a mullet. You know, like, you know, I was like, so one day I asked him, I go, why are you wearing a mullet? He goes, that's how they told me. That's how I, I forget if it was Paulie or Cornet or Cornet, one of the two told him to cut his hair that way. I'm like, why? He's like, I don't know. I didn't want to do it. I'm like, okay, good. That's uh, that made me feel better about the guy. <laughs> and you had a fan question that wanted to know if it's true you brought Kimona into ECW, and did you ever date her? Uh, yes, I brought her in, but no, I didn't date her. Um, she was a buddy of mine's girlfriend. Like I was DJing at a strip club one night a week because I had no clubs to go out to. And I go, you know, because I used to go out seven nights a week. You know, and then I'd be on the road for two, and I'd go out after the show. Um, in the ECW. And so Monday nights, there was nowhere to go. So I figured I might as well get paid to, um, you know, to hang out at a club. So I, I started DJing and my buddy was a DJ and, and Kimono was a dancer there and I was his girlfriend. And so I needed a new valet. So I'm like, Hey, she'd be perfect. You know, Oriental, you know, or Asian, you know, I thought she'd be a cool look to have. And, um, and so I didn't, I didn't even hit on her because it was my buddy's girlfriend, but yeah, she dated a bunch of the boys. She's a real sweetheart, though, you know. But, yeah, she's really she's a really nice person. And another uh, valet that dated a bunch of the boys was Sunny. She's in the news again this week. I'm sure you probably heard. What's your opinion of her and all of her issues? Uh, what's, what's the latest news? I didn't hear. Uh, she was arrested, I think. We're what Wednesday today. She was arrested on Monday with three charges related to driving uh, and I think violating a parole and something else. Yeah, I, I feel bad for. Her. I mean, she's. I've always gotten along really, really well with her, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I feel bad for her. I feel bad that she hasn't, you know, she hasn't hit either rock bottom yet to, you know, to get clean or. You know, or I don't know. I mean, you, you never want someone to hit rock bottom, but sometimes they have to hit rock bottom, you know, to, to, to get clean. And, you know, the only the only way it ends up is you end up dead jailer. You end up dead cleaner in prison. So hopefully she ends up clean and not dead or in prison. It probably doesn't look good for her since she just came out of jail for a year and was on probation to be arrested again, unfortunately. Uh, th th then prison is probably where it's going to end up, unfortunately. And you had a match against Terry Gordy in ECW. How was that experience? That was one of my proudest matches ever. Um, because Gordy had, had suffered a, an aneurysm or something or brain damage because he had an overdose. And he just couldn't work the same as he did before because his his brain didn't work as efficient as effectively anymore, and uh, and so he wasn't so he wasn't the same Terry Gordy, and uh, and I put together a match that I knew he could follow, that you know I made it organic. So like if after this happens, the only the thing where it leads to is this next spot, which leads to this next thing. That's what I tried to do in all my matches. Like I didn't want him to look choreographed at all, but. They they were tightly choreographed. A lot of it, um, I just made it look like it wasn't. But you know, it's a simple thing. Like, you know, if you if you hit a if you hit a guy and knock him down, and then let's say the next spot is you're going to shoot him off the ropes. The guy can most times the guy just lays there in the center. You got to pick him up and you got to push him to the ropes or punch him to the ropes and then shoot him off. What I would do is if I got if that was me is I would tell the guy when I when you go down, start crawling to the ropes already. When you stand up from the road at the ropes and turn around, I'll be right there to shoot you off. So it's so it, it's very or it's very uh, choreographed, but it doesn't look it because it looks like he's trying to get away. And all of a sudden, oh, there there I am to shoot him off. You know what I mean? And it doesn't yeah. waste all that all that time with me picking him up and then punching him in the face 18,000 times just to get him to the ropes. Um, and so I set up a match, you know, that I thought he could follow perfectly. And he did. And, and it was, man, it was, and that was probably the, the, me and Sandman always uh, argue over who had the biggest pop in company history, whether it was my return from WCW or his return, but really the biggest pop was uh, Terry Gordy. And but I was, course, still in that, I was still in that match though. So I get that pop. I get to have to credit. <laughs> 
true. And I guess he didn't last probably very long there because of those, uh, the brain aneurysm stuff. Yeah, uh, not, I don't think it was an aneurysm. I don't think it was an aneurysm. It was a, uh, I don't know what it was, but the, uh, but he, Paulie tried to use him as long as he could because Paulie had so much respect for him, you know, for what he, for what he was. And you've talked about this to death, but a lot of fans still want me to ask you about the crucifixion, crucifixion incident. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to say at this point other than, you know, I, uh, I got out of rehab and, um, and I wanted to make a dynamic impact. So I was like, yeah, why don't I crucify Sandman? So, you know, because Raven always said that he was a martyr for society's dysfunction. And, uh, and I wanted Sandman to feel my pain, you know, so... We, uh, we, we, I made him build his own cross because I, you know, I don't have any carpentry skills. So he built his own cross and then, uh, and then we set it up and, and it worked, it worked perfectly. But the only problem was Kurt Angle was there because uh, Paulie was trying to hire him and, uh, and Kurt Angle had never seen pro wrestling. And, and all of a sudden he's like, what the fuck is this? The guy's getting crucified, you know, on a cross. And so he wigged out and then Taz wigged out and, and then, then they started going, well, it's because you, you're Jewish and Paulie's Jewish and Todd Gordon's Jewish. That's why you can do this. I'm like, no. I go, they go, why don't you make a Jewish star? I'm like, if I made a Jewish star, he'd roll away. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the wrong heat. It was the right kind of heat. People were like, oh, fuck, you know, like the, in a good way. But, you know, he made me go out and apologize. And I gave the most insincere, sincere apology ever. And uh, but it uh, and then. um. I don't know. I thought it was really good stuff, you know, because like, you know, I was using and, and it had nothing to do with religion. It was I was using it because the iconic iconography of, of the cross um, and Raven's whole martyr for society's dysfunction. And, you know, and it just it led itself to being to being a, a great work of art, I thought, you know, as, a, as Raven's artwork. Um, but that's not what happened. That's not what, um, the, yeah, you know, if Kurt wouldn't have been there, I, I think it would have, it would have just nothing would, nobody would have cared. Plus here's the thing. We're the rebel promotion. If you're the rebel promotion, you don't apologize. Even if you cross the line, you, you know, you try not to cross the line, but even if you do, you don't apologize for it because you're the rebels, you know, rebels don't apologize, you know, yeah. even when they cross the line. And so I thought it was a bad deal all the way around, but, yeah, you know, it happens. But yeah, you could you could still have a third another promotion, an ECW kind of promotion. Um, except you'd have to have somebody who had a connection to get it on TV, because without TV, it's you get you going nowhere fast. Yeah. Now you ended up getting recruited back to WCW at that point in time. I think they may have been uh, if not ahead of WWE getting there. How did that process work? Uh when you jumped to them, I'm sure WWE may have offered you something at that time too. Well, when I left, when I was in ECW, WWE hadn't, didn't offer me anything. WCW did. And, uh, and plus I didn't, I didn't want to go back to WWE because I, they would have, I don't think they would have used me the way they, um, the, the way I wanted to be used, you know? And, um, and so when I got to WCW, they used me really well at first, but then I just felt like it was my time to move up the card and they didn't, you know, there was the, there was 10 guys, you know, 10, at least 10 guys ahead of me, you know, that were all, that had been on top for years that weren't stepping down. So, you know, what are you going to do? And I think you were one of the most iconic characters from that Nitro era. Thank you. It did you have uh, much creative pull when when they brought you in? Yeah, they 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 surprisingly Eric let me. Um, he said uh, he said you're the only person besides Hogan that I let have creative control over his stuff. Not not full control, mind you, but you know let you come up with your own storylines. And then he then he uh, gave then he had when he, when Dusty came back, uh, he had, he had Dusty work with me in Saturn, you know, so we could keep coming up with our own stuff. But I was I, I tried to be really smart about it. Like I tried to do angles only with guys on my own level or lower, because I knew if I asked for top uh, top guys that they weren't going to they either wouldn't let me do it or I would end up doing a job at the end, you know, and, and, and come out the loser. Not the 
the I come out the loser of the storyline, not the angle. And I, 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 at the end of the match, I'm at the end of the series. I'm always going to lose because I'm the heel. But I, I didn't want to think I'd be able to come out as strong in the storyline unless I was working with somebody I knew, like DDP. So I tried to keep my angles with like Canyon, DDP, the Flock. You know, guys that were you know that they they wouldn't have a problem with me shining the way I needed to shine. You know, and uh, and I so I tried to be smart about it like that. Um, but, uh, well, I like the idea of me sitting in the stands, that was Terry Taylor's idea. That was a brilliant idea. Yeah. And I think that was also his idea to have me pass out instead of tapping to Benoit. Now, is it true that the flock would often get fucked up in the stands? Yeah. Oh yeah. We were drinking. We we're getting drunk. One time we tried to call our ecstasy dealer, but, uh, he couldn't show up in time. Was alcohol pretty much accepted backstage in WCW? We've, we've heard the stories of Hogan having the garbage can full of beer backstage. I don't know. Hogan's locker room was a whole, you know, that was a separate locker room for Hogan and his buddies. Um, you know, uh, no, I don't think, you know, I don't think people had beer backstage, you know, but everybody was pilled up, though, you know. How much control did you have over the members of the flock? I didn't have enough because if it was up to me, they would have got wins. Like they used to like Kidman would always complain. He goes, how come you can't get us any wins? I'm like, I try. And I go, I go to Sullivan. I go, come on, give these guys some wins. And someone would go, somebody, some have to die so that others may live. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but can't they, uh, do they have to be the ones that die every time? And he's <laughs> like, and he's like, and I didn't realize like Sullivan at the time was like, it was like, um, he would he would do he would do stuff like he would say to try and get me to to come up with something on my like okay like I come up with an idea and uh, so I find out I get to the show and they'd say um and they'd call me in to give me the finish and I, they'd say we need you to put over so and so and I go that's a great idea but but because I'm doing this and this wouldn't it be better if I went over and like that and so I so because of that I wouldn't I didn't do a lot of jobs. Uh, not that I was, and, and it's not that like they had a problem with it because it was just asking logically. Like if I would have left and came, like Kenya used to say, how do you get away with that? And I'm like, well, first of all, you can't leave and come back because they'll just go, oh, we already sent it to the truck. Oh, we can't change it. I go, you have to come up with the idea on the spot and you have to have a good fucking reason, a better reason than what they have. Otherwise, why would they change it? So I would always have to have a, a better reason. And then it, I didn't realize, but the Sullivan, like, it became like a challenge. Like, it's, I mean, him would, it was like a, it was like a, a friendly competition to, uh, to come up with ways of not me, me, uh, me to not lose and him to get me to lose. <laughs> now, as far as Van Hammer, he was a guy that seemingly had a WCW contract for years and years and years, never really went anywhere. Uh, what was your opinion of him? I know he's had his, serious uh, brushes with the law lately yeah i i like the hammer but i didn't i didn't want him in the flock i didn't want uh, almost none of those guys that i want other than saturn and sick boy because i wanted all new guys like i would i felt like if you give me retreads people know they're retreads like rigs at least we did something to make them into a you know into a character with us but like you know and kidman was fairly new so that was cool too but when they started giving me you know and horace was was uh, Hulk's nephew, so that was definitely going to be put a. Jimmy Hart goes, "Hey, can you do Hulk a favor? Put a horse in a flock." I'm like, I don't have any say in it, but absolutely, it's, it's, if Hulk wants it, that's fine with me. But like Hammer and Reese, no offense, like I like both of them, and I was glad for, for friendly purpose, social purposes, that they were in the flock. But I didn't want to pick them because they they would just look like guys who were just getting a new act. You know what I mean? Like it was just, oh, that's a guy. Let's put him in that act because we have nothing for him. Whereas a guy like Hammer, I would have taken him off TV for a year and revamped him on his own. You know what I mean? Or find a way to repackage him. But you can't. I hated when they would just take a guy one week who was so-and-so and the next week they'd repackage him and he'd be so-and-so without being off, you know, a different guy without being off TV for a while. John Tenta, I think, was the worst for that. And maybe Brutus Beefcake, too, in WCW. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, as far as Perry Saturn, have you heard anything about him lately? He seems to have dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to him lately. Like, uh, I was in, we were in touch for a while when he surfaced, but when things aren't going well, he tends to disappear. Um, 
and he doesn't want to be he doesn't want to be a burden to anybody which is a shame because he's such a great guy and everybody loves him but uh yeah i gotta i gotta in fact the other day my uh my ex-wife my ex-wife's my best friend like we um we're closer now than when we were married if that's even possible and um and we uh and she was even saying she's like you gotta call us yeah she goes like when's the last time you called saturn i got like a month ago she's like did you hear and um and i go but he didn't return my call like he doesn't he's really bad about returning calls when he's not doing well she's like you need to check up on him again i'm she's right so i gotta i gotta give him a call again at least a couple calls and i guess steven richard said in a shoot interview i don't know if you've heard about this that he felt you took advantage of him in wcw um did you ever see that clip wcw Apparently, uh, according to this fan question, he said this in an RF video shoot interview. I took advantage of him in WCW? Yeah. He was only there for a couple of weeks, and then he quit. I bear, I hardly even remember him from WCW. So, yeah, I didn't see the clip myself. That was just a fan question, so there's the answer. You didn't hear anything about it. Um, now you had a, a match against Goldberg where, uh, he beat you for the U S championship. Any thoughts on him? And, and I guess he was probably the biggest star WCW created from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. He was a star. He, he had got a lot of bad advice. Like I've, I've seen him since, you know, in the last couple of years, not the last couple of years, but probably in the last five, 10 years. And he was, uh, he was, he was very thankful to me for putting it, for helping him with such a, to have such a good match. And he was uh, very apologetic about not listening more to me about like trying to get him to sell some and stuff like that. And uh, he's like, oh, like, I just had a lot of the wrong people in my ear. And I'm like, yeah, it's totally understandable, you know. But uh, but no, I, I like Bill. I've always I've known Bill for years. He's a really good guy. Um, and and I'm really proud of that match too because you know considering his uh, his ability to work, I think I got one of the th one of the three best matches out of him ever. You know. Are you impressed with the longevity he's had recently? I think he was still champion this year. Um, not too long ago, he held the t WWE title. You know, he's smart. Like, he got away, and he became valuable again, you know? And he uh, and people, like, look, people want to love the guy. He, he looks like a machine. Nikita Koloff was probably the first person to do that character, you know, when he, Nikita was a baby face. Same character, the jacked-up, like, maniac, you know, machine who looks like he could kill anybody. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy for Bill. I'm real happy for him. A couple of fans had this question. I don't recall it because it was obviously over 20 years ago now, but I guess you had a famous stare down with the Macho Man in WCW that I guess some fans felt there was more to it than just an angle. Yeah, the um, I've, the only reason I even remember it is because I've seen pictures on Twitter of me and him staring off, and uh, I think they just did it. I don't even remember exactly how they why or anything other than I think it was just a, you know a, a, a tease. I, I don't know. I don't think we ever had any contact. I don't, I don't think. I guess you didn't hang out with him much backstage or anything. He seemed to be someone that would uh, do his own thing. Yeah, the the really top guys all hung together, and and then um, and then the Mexican guys hung together. Um, me and Saturn and a group of guys would all hang together. You know, you know it breaks down into into cliques, you know, into factions. You know, just you get along with people you get along with, and and it's always easier to get to get. It's also you. It's not so much a hierarchy, although it is, but you tend to hang out with the people you're working with, you know? So if you're working on top, you're hanging out with the top guys. You know, if you're working in the middle, you're hanging out with the middle guys. I see. Um, what did you think about his early passing? Macho man's. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I feel, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, it's crazy. So many people pass young in this business. I'm going to guess the Ultimate Warrior was similar to Macho Man. You didn't have much contact with him when he was back there. No, not much at all. And of course, everyone remembers the fan attacking you. That's another <laughs> Twitter clip that's, I think it's more infamous now than when it happened. Uh, what was going through your head during that? Well, the, the whole crazy thing is, is every time I sit in the corner, 
I never let anybody attack me before the match because, you know, I, I'm not because I, I was saving that. I knew one day I would, but you know, you have to let it. You know, just you can't just do it for any old. You know, I wanted to save it for a big angle, and so me and Canyon were feuding, and I go, you know, and the exact same day, me and Canyon started talking about. I was like, you know what? Why don't you attack me from the while I'm sitting in the corner? And then out of, you come out of the crowd and attack me while I'm sitting in the corner. It'd be cool as shit. And he's like, all right. I go, I go let's try and get a pass for next week. Um, so then I'm sitting in the corner that night. All of a sudden, I feel someone pulling on my hair. And it's so weird because, in a, it, uh, you know, it's like within one second, less than a second, I'm already going with it and going out to the floor. But in that half a second, like you, you're an athlete, you know, you're a worker. You've had time slow down, haven't you? Where you're yeah. in the zone. Well, and also in attack in attack situations, uh, when right. I've been bouncer and stuff, I understand that. Yeah, it's like all of a sudden time slows down. And, and in this half a second, like there was like a 30 second conversation in my head. I'm like, is it Canyon? No, it can't be Canyon. Why would he do it this week? But why would a fan attack me? I can't see a fan attack. I mean, security would pull him off. Oh, man, what do I do? Do I go with it or do I fight it and let him rip my hair out? Now nah, it's got to be Canyon. I mean, all that in like half a second, all that went through my brain. It's like time had slowed down. And after watching it back, because I just did some um, uh, podcast about it, I was like, holy shit, that was quick. I thought it was, I thought it was much longer because I had all that memory of it. But uh, but yeah, so then I just went with it and then I landed on it, took a bump, got up. And then as soon as I saw it was some guy, some skinny 80 pound guy, I was like, motherfucker. And I, but I couldn't even hit him because the security had him already. So I was like, if I hit him, I'll get sued. So I said, what do I do? Well, I go back in the ring and cut my promo, act like nothing happened. And then the mic didn't work, but I thought it was still going out to the home, even though it wasn't working. So I kept cutting it because even though it wasn't working in the house, I figured it was working at home, but apparently it wasn't working at home either, at least until okay. then it got it fixed. Um, but yeah, but it's a, it's just, it, the, what it made, the interesting thing to me is how long I felt like it, I, how much time I had in my head to think about what to do, what was going on, you know, and yet it was, it was that it's crazy how time slows down. What was the reaction of everyone in the back when you got backstage after that? I don't know. I don't remember. Let me think. Uh, I haven't thought about that. Um, I guess they were like, as what the fuck as I was, you know? And then some people were laughing because the guy was like 90 pounds, you know? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I remember, I think Conan laughing, going, ah, you know? Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. And then me and Canyon were just like, man, I go, Canyon, I thought it was you. He's like, what? He's like, I, we weren't going to do it until next week. I go, I know, but I figured it had to be you. We're like, what are the odds that the same day I finally decide to have somebody do it is the same day somebody pulls me out of the pull go attacks me you know yeah and and it, and it was also like as much as the boys tease me about it, i'm like hey that's just heat baby that's because i got so much heat what do you think today i mean some wrestlers i've heard sammy Zayn recently got a fan kicked out of a wwe event for saying something offensive whereas back in the older days even before your time fan attacks were rare but like you'd get attacked by a fan and it was just part of the job but now it seems even like an an insult from a fan will hurt a wrestler's feelings that's ridiculous um unless unless the guy was unless the guy said something like i'm gonna kill your mom or something you know but i, I don't know what was what was said that it had to be pretty bad if sammy got him thrown out i'd imagine apparently uh he called him a faggot or something yeah um well i mean that's poor choice of language but you're not gonna i wouldn't throw somebody out for that but the uh but i can tell you something that's really funny when i was working in memphis my first territory um they didn't have guardrails they had stanchions with a rope connecting each stanchion and uh and so i was wrestling this guy singing this uh cowboy don bass and don bass was a hell of a worker not ron bass but a don bass shorter stockier guy He's hilarious guy and uh so he's choking me with the rope and then, uh, cause I was a baby face and some fan, some big fat lady tries to help. And she's like, you leave him alone and grabs him. But now she's putting pressure on him and now he's really choking me and he's trying not to, but she's grabbing him and it's forcing him to choke me even harder. And she almost killed me. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. 
So what was the straw that broke the camel's back for you to leave WCW? Um, I wasn't happy with the way I was being used at that point. I, I felt like it was my time, you know, and I was also, you know, self-destructive, which I didn't realize. And, um, you know, I had demons and issues, which I did know about, but the, um, I just felt like it was my turn and I wasn't getting, and then, uh, Eric said, you know, there's a door. I'm like, all right, there's a door. I'll take it. You know, I figured I'd go to WWE at that point, but then Eric said, I'm not letting you go to WWE. And I go, well, you just told me there's the door. So, I mean, he's like, well, you can't go there. And then, uh, and then we talked some more that night and then, uh, he laid out an idea that he had for me. And I was about to come back and say, you know, I'll stay. But then when I found out that the the extent of it, I was like, this isn't going to raise me any, you know, it's going to leave me on the, in the same or lower level, even though it's, it was a good idea though. It was a really good idea. Um, but, um, but anyway, you know, so I quit and then, uh, went to ECW and then became a really big addict. My addiction got really bad. And, but then it also led me to getting clean. So you know, it all worked out for a reason. And you mentioned earlier the pop you got when you came back to ECW, probably the biggest pop in ECW history. Was that your idea to return that way? Um, I know. I, I'm sure that was Paulie's idea because I knew that I wasn't going to wait for the 90 day clause because I knew I didn't have a case. You know, I, even though everybody take and and so um, everybody always take waits the 90 days because. It's easier than getting heat, but you know, not me. I have to get heat wherever I go. So I was like, no, I'm not waiting. And so Paul, it fit for perfectly into Paulie's storyline because the uh, the uh, the Dudleys were leaving that day, and so it worked out perfect. But the reason it was so surprising was because nobody expected me for at least ninety days. You know, why do you think that the the show on TNN that ECW had wasn't successful? I think a lot of it had to do with. Uh, Paulie being burnt out, you know, like, and he didn't have the same quality of talent that he had before, you know, the same characters and, you know, he'd been booking the same people for, you know, parts of the same people for like six years now. That's why bookers back in the day would change every year, you know, every six months to a year, they would swap up bookers because you can only, you know, be creative with the same talent for, for so long. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so I think part of it was that. Part of it was that I don't think the network pushed us like they should have. Um, and uh, I don't know. You know, I, I, I always, I really thought they were going to go somewhere. I was really surprised they didn't. Maybe there was just so much wrestling on, t on the air. Maybe people were burning out, you know. Did you ever have pay issues with ECW in those later years? Not really. No, Paulie always paid me. And when you went back to WWE, uh, who was the one that helped negotiate that deal to get you back there? JR. You're most. Awesome. Uh, yeah. That's where you had your big uh, record title reign with the hardcore title. Uh, were you expecting to be more high up on the card at that time? Or were you kind of not surprised where they kept you? You still had a decent run. Yeah, no, I was really disappointed. I mean, I really felt like they could have used me better. Um, but I just, I think I had too much personal heat with, uh, you know, with the office. So, Because you were uh, close with Austin before, was there ever any talk of maybe pairing you with Austin in a feud at that time? No, the, uh, they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have, um, put me in that position they just didn't you know i don't think it's that they didn't see me that way i just think that they uh that it was just heat i think it was heat probably you know i i've gotten a lot of heat in a lot of places for a lot of reasons and a lot of it was my fault some of it wasn't but a lot of it was so you know i'll, I'll take responsibility there's some story out there on the internet that the fans wanted me to ask you about i didn't personally hear about this but apparently you were showing off for Deborah or something and, and Stone no, Cold that or that, something. No, that that's totally what happened was is I was in the I was in the shower and then Austin and them came in, they decided to film in the locker room where I was in the shower, and I came out of the shower in a towel and uh 
and basically Austin and, and was there with Deborah, and he was being, and of course he he's like, what the fuck, you know, why are you coming out with a towel? And I'm like, I was in the shower. I didn't know. Fuck it. I didn't even know you guys were in here, you know? And so it was just a misunderstanding. And obviously you've appeared with him in recent years on his podcast and so forth. So the, uh, the story is just, I guess, developed over time. Yeah. It's uh, it was just one of those misunderstanding things, you know, Austin forgave me for it, you know, but it, it, I can see his point of view, you know, to what it looks like to him, you know, but then from my point of view, I didn't even know they were fucking there, you know. What were the original plans for your feud with M Matt Hardy and the seven deadly sins storyline? Uh, that was a whole, that's a whole long thing. That, that was the greatest storyline I ever came up with. I mean, it was it's so brilliant. Um, I still eventually I'd like to uh, like to implement it someplace someday. So I'm not going to really go into details, but um, the uh, yeah, it would have involved a lot of people. But um, but uh, in fact, that's the idea I sold Vince on to, and um, that he wanted to, that it once uh, I sold him on it to the point that he had me quit Monday, Sunday night heat and uh, and not do a job for Memphis in, in Memphis for Lawler which is ridiculous. Like, and then I got heat with Lawler because Lawler thought I didn't want to put him over. And I'm like, that's not, I didn't, I want to No, Why would I not want to put you over? You're my, you're the greatest worker in my mind. Of course I'll put you over in a, anywhere, anytime. Um, the, uh, and he had me quit heat and, um, and not do the job to Lawler in Memphis. And um, what else? And something else. And then, oh, then he asked me to be on a booking committee again, like just like, you know, 20 years earlier or 10 years earlier. And, uh, but I didn't want to be in a, once again, I still didn't want to be in, in a booking committee, you know, so I turned it down and then we were going to start the idea. And then Pat got in Vince's ear and Pat, cause he never liked me. He, um, he goes, um, he, he goes, Vince, he goes, you really think he can pull this off? He goes, we should do the idea on heat instead of raw. And, uh, like, you know, of course I could pull it off, you know, but to Vince, he probably never even, like, I, I bet he didn't even know I was in WCW. I think he just thought I was an ECW guy, and he didn't think so highly of them, you know, just garbage wrestlers. So I don't think he thought that, you know, he knew of what I was capable of, you know. So he was like, all right, we'll do the idea on Heat. And then for, like, four weeks, they wouldn't do the idea. And then finally I had to go to Vince and go, hey, um, are we going to start this thing? He's like, I thought we already were starting it. you know. But he doesn't follow, you know, the mid-card and underneath stuff really that much. So I'm like, no, he's like, all right, we'll start it now. But by then, Vince is one of those guys that he's hot or cold. Like, if he's hot for an idea, he's like, immediately, that's why he was like, when I want you to join the booking committee. I'm like, I don't want to join. He goes, well, I, he goes, um, he goes, well, I'm going to want you to quit heat right now. I don't want you to lose the Lawler. I want you to get off of there because he was hot about the idea, you know, excited. But then when he gets cold, but now it's been four weeks now since, you know, and now he's cold about it because he's like, ah, well, we'll start it tonight. And, um, and then we did, and then, then three weeks, three or four weeks later, I got, I got let go, you know, cause whatever. And, uh, and that was the end of that. Interesting. Now they always, I actually heard, uh, Vince McMahon say recently that WWE has evolved with now they have like 30 writers or, or more probably. What do you think about the massive writing team they have now compared to the the smaller writing teams they had in the past. I liked when they had just a booker, you know, a booker and maybe a couple people that were subservient to them, you know, and let some guy and let one guy have the vision. But, but then again, it's always Vince's vision. So there is really that he just has, instead of a couple guys underneath him, he has 30 guys, but it's still Vince. Vince is still the one calling all the shots. So, I mean, it is kind of the same thing. Just, he has a more diverse group to choose from. So I, I don't think there's a problem with that, but I think there has to be one guy in charge, one guy's vision. But I also think that that guy has to be replaced every so often because you're going to burn out, you know, and, and it's always good to get another, you know, somebody else's take on stuff. How long do you think uh, they're going to keep Pritchard in charge of, of Raw and SmackDown I mean, this week, I think they hit the all-time lowest viewership ever. Uh, yeah, and then SmackDown's been in the 0.4s. I'm not saying that it's necessarily Bruce's fault, but it seems they look for scapegoats every now and then. 
Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't keep that tight. I like I said, I don't watch it. I keep an, a, a general idea of what's going on. You know, I like to have an idea because it is you know my business, but I don't follow it. You know, it's it, I don't know. Um, I think he'll be there until Vince decides that he needs somebody else there to change things up to somebody else's vision. And then, but it'll always be Vince though. Like Vince, I think Vince is his own worst enemy because he always has yes men. And I think, you, you know, I don't think that's a smart idea, but I don't think that's a smart way to do business. But then again, Vince is such a brilliant businessman that that's why his company stayed around when everybody else folded because he know he kept it from a business point of view afloat, you know, didn't always make the best moves storyline wise. Um, and, uh, but as far as a businessman, he knows what he's doing. And so, but by storyline wise, by always having yes, guy, yes, and men, he's never going to, you know, you, you can only, I think it's very, it's extremely limiting, you know, unless you find somebody like a rocker in Austin who just get all, get over so quickly that, you know, anything they touch is magic. Do you think that uh, AJ Styles could be a bigger star? I know you had a hand in his training. Uh, no, he is no. a top star. No, you didn't? No, I'd, I'd love to take credit for AJ, but no, I, I can't take any credit other than I've given him some pointers and some ideas. But for the most part, you know, AJ, AJ's just he's phenomenal. I mean, he, you know, he really is. Um, uh I haven't seen him in years, though, because I don't watch it. So I don't know what he's doing now, but I heard it's better than ever. So that's great, you know. And CM Punk is another guy you, you worked with a little bit early on in his career. He's always a hot topic. Uh, recently, the WWE backstage show he was on got canceled. There's talk again that is he going to show up in AEW? Uh, what are your thoughts on him overall? I, I like punk. Um, it's funny, punk. I, I always, I always tell this story, but punk at one point thought he was the greatest worker in the business, and he was anything but. But he eventually did become the greatest worker in the business, so that's pretty cool, you know, that he actually became what he thought he was. Um, and uh, and and I really respect the hell out of him for uh, for joining the MMA. Like most people think, oh, what a dummy, you know, but. I, I respect the hell out of him because look, if you're not, if, if that's what makes you happy, if you want to, if you have goals and you got to go after them and the fact that he was willing to do it, I, my only can, my only downside to that was my, or the dis, never, negative to it is I never would have made my first match UFC. You know, I would have started in Bellator or somewhere else, you know, where they're going to groom you, you know, I wouldn't have made it such a high profile of a thing. And in fact, last time I saw him, we talked about that. And he said the amount of money they offered him, he had to take it. And I was like, eh, I don't know. I still would have started in Bellator, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, I think he they made were at the, least five hundred grand a fight. Was it Bellator? But he didn't need the money. That's that's part of the thing. If you don't need the money, you know, and Bellator, they would have protected him. They would have given him somebody he could beat, you know. Yeah. And they would have groomed him. Whereas UFC, they just throw you to the wolves, which is cool too, you know, which is also. You know, that's where people are made. You know, you get made that way, but you can get broke that way, too. And, of course, you were NWA champion when you were in uh, TNA. That was a big run for you. Uh, what are your overall thoughts uh, of your big run that you had with that company? I'm grateful to them for allowing me to, um, to uh, finish up my career in a better way than the way I went out in WWE, you know. So I'll always be grateful for that. I had a lot of fun there. I had a lot of disappointment there. A lot of, you know, a lot of both sides of emotions. Um, the, uh, I think that, well, okay. Um, I think that uh, I'm also lucky that Jeff Jarrett, you know, like, you know, for publicly bad mouthing, you know, or, you know, the, the booking and stuff, which really, if you think about it, okay, look, if I, if I ran a company and people started bad mouthing the product, I'd fire them, you know, or I'd talk to them. And if they kept doing it, I'd fire them. Like, why would you let somebody bad mouth your product? Even if, even if the product was shitty, you know what I mean? And the fact that Jeff, you know, kept me, kept me around and let me keep working there, no matter how bad I buried the company. Cause when I was upset about it, 
I think speaks uh, speaks a lot to his, you know, class. You know, I think that's so. I've always respected Jeff for that. Um, and uh, and but by the same token, I think they could have done so many things different and so many things to grow the company. And so they made so many mistakes. But look, dude, they're they're his made mistakes to make. You know, it's his company. Are you surprised WWE ended up putting Jared in the Hall of Fame after all that uh, went on between the two over the years? Yeah, I am surprised about that. But but Jeff's a really good guy, though. I mean, everybody likes Jeff, you know, even people that, that, that hated the way he used them like Jeff. You know, Jeff's just a really likable guy, you know. Did you ever party with Jeff? Because I've heard from several people he was a big party or two uh, at various times. Yeah, no, I was never, we were never really hung in the same circles. And my partying came to an end, you know, way back uh, in uh, 99, 2000, no, in 2000, I guess. I think that's when my partying came to an extinct. Right before I went to WWE, it, it ended. I got clean. What was your favorite part of your TNA run? Um, I don't know. Uh... I like the uh, the Clockwork Orange matches because I came up with the design. Uh, I like the Hangman's Horror match. I think it was called. I came up. I think I came up with that design too. Um, the I hated when a uh, vampire. I mean, when a uh, Bandy shaved my head and scalped me. That, uh, that, that was a fan me. question. Who came up with that idea? It was my idea to get my hair cut, but uh, I didn't expect Bandy to use the wrong side of the sheep shears. <laughs> okay, so it was painful. I was really fucking painful. You have no idea how painful. Like, literally, like, blood's pouring down my face. I got so mad, but it was Vandy and me and him were, have always been really close friends. And I got to the back, and I wanted to punch him so badly because he's fucking, because it hurt. And uh, and he didn't mean it. He just wasn't paying attention. He was so enraptured in the moment. He was so, he was, like, orgasmic for him in this big angle because he loves wrestling so much. And uh, and, and I wanted to punch him. And I pulled my hand, arm back to swing. And I would have hated myself if I would have really hit him because, A, that's not me, and B, he's my friend. So, But as I'm going to swing at him, I turned it into a working forearm to the chest. <laughs> <laughs> like, luckily, like halfway through the punch, I was able to get my sanity back and go, okay, I can't hit him for this. And I to give him a working punch in the chest, a working forearm in the chest. You've said uh, in other interviews that your dad worked for the National Enquirer. Yeah. Um, you had a fan question. They wanted to know if you think that helped your uh, your creativity in the long run, having a father that worked for a tabloid like that. It didn't affect it one way or the other. They, they, were, um, they were the highest paying newspaper in the world. Like they pay more. They paid like four times with the Washington Post. Or what the New York Times paid, and my dad was like a preeminent journalist, and he uh, he was the number two guy there for like 10, 15 years. He was a big a big shot, you know. The um, so yeah, so but I always used to tease him. I'd go, yeah, Dad, I I followed in your footsteps. You wrestle, you worked for a fake paper, and I worked for a fake wrestling company. <laughs> and you were doing DDP yoga at one time. How did that work out for you? Yeah, I I like doing it. Um. I stopped doing it because of the coronavirus uh, and because I stopped having a trainer because of the coronavirus. Um, and, uh, but also it, it also, my, I have such damage in my shoulder. Like I, when I had my, I had the left shoulder, I did ha a half replacement put in it. You don't get the, they said to get the half replacement instead of the full because it lasts longer. Um, but he, the, the, the orthopedic surgeon, the head orthopedic surgeon for the Atlanta Braves said I had the two worst shoulders he's ever seen. So I was really proud of that. But, you know, if they're going to be terrible, they might as well be the worst. But so I had that one fixed up and uh, and I can still only rotate it to there. That's and that's good. That's like and and, and I, I, I'm i happy with this because I can put it behind my back now. The other one only rotates to here. That's terrible. Only reaches up to here and um, can't go behind my back. It can only go to there. Um, so I really got to get this one done. But it, so. And, and I've tried, even with the yoga, it won't stretch out. It won't, like, so it's also difficult to do a lot of the yoga because I can't use that shoulder. So when I stopped having a trainer, um, I lost interest in doing it because it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And it, it's, and it was always making my shoulder worse because even though I protected during the exercises, 
you know, it's still it's still damaging. So and also I didn't expect the coronavirus to go this long. You know, I figured we'd have a I didn't remember I didn't count on the president being so incompetent. But that's neither here nor there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to start doing it again soon. But uh, but this shoulder needs surgery badly or stem cells or something. Obviously, with the lockdown, there's no wrestling going on. But are you still doing indie bookings despite those uh, issues? No, I got I got pre-existing conditions, so I'm not taking any bookings until this thing has a till we come out the other side of this with a vaccine or something. Because uh, I have type two diabetes. I've also had a heart attack, so I have a stint. Um, the um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm I'm with the pre-existing conditions. I'm you know I don't want to. I don't want to go on the road. Like the other day, Luke Gall- Gallows had a pay-per-view. Uh, and, uh, and he wanted me to come do some a spot with him. But I, I was like, man, I, I just can't. I can't. You know, I don't want to be around the boys because, you know, I, I'm going to not. No one's going to be wearing masks, probably, you know, at least because they're doing stuff on camera. And people are going to there's going to be hugging and photos and, you know, and people will be like, yeah, let's take a photo. And I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to, I mean, as much as I want to see the boys, I just don't want to, um, you know, take a chance, especially now with it flaring up so bad. Is it true that you were doing some writing for impact in recent years? No, no, um, no, they, uh, they didn't ask me to do that. They were, they, they, the at last episode before the coronavirus, they were in Atlanta and they had me, uh, agent some matches and, uh, there was some talk about me, uh, coming in there, but, uh, but then the coronavirus hit, so everything changed. So you were back there for Steiner's heart attack. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, they they literally saved his life there. The uh, the EMTs there uh, at the building literally saved his life. Like they the uh, when when the paramedics or I I forget who it was. I think there was an EM two EMTs at the building or something. But when the paramedics came, they said, "Man, you really need to thank those two guys because they they literally saved his life." Wow. Yeah. Uh, have you been to uh, Steiner's Shoney's since you live in the Atlanta area? Yeah, I was there. Uh, I, um, I've been there before. It's it's not near me. I mean, it's like 30 minutes away, 25 minutes. So I don't go there, but I've been there before. How did you get along with Steiner over your career? You've been in the same companies. You said Rick is our is a buddy of yours. Yeah, me and Rick get along really well. Um, me, and me and Scott, we, we get along fine. I mean, but we don't, we, you know, we've never had a long conversations, you know, or warm showers into the middle, middle of the night or anything, but you know, we get along fine, you know. And a fan wanted to know your max bench press squat and deadlift in your peak. Ah, I can actually do some bragging on this. Um, when I was in college, I, uh, I got off the gas, you know, cause I was on the gas a lot in college. Um, Cause I was, I was 150, I was 160 pounds when I started. No, no, wait, I was 129 pounds when I started lifting. And, uh, and then I got up to like one, uh, I think I got up to like 180 something, went in the Marine Corps, came back. I was 170. And, uh, cause I took a semester off of college to go into Marine Corps, but then I was 170 and I was like, nah, I got to do some gas. And so I did a bunch of steroids and got up, finally got up to like 220 you know, after years of training, you know, I've been training for like, since I was like 16 or 15. And, um, but I don't have the genetics for, uh, for bodybuilding at all or for weightlifting. Like, I mean, I really had to work, you know, work out hard and take a lot of steroids. Um, and, uh, anyway, so I was in college. I took a, I, 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 I took some, um, I, I'm sorry. I took myself off the, off the roids because I wanted to see how much I could lift without it. And I entered a powerlifting meet and, uh, I weighed 209. I was too lazy to cut weight to 198 to the, to the next weight level. So I was up, I, I was against the two twenties and I did a 550 uh, squat, which is really good. A 570 deadlift and a measly, this is how bad I was at benching. Cause I got long arms, a 340 bench with a bench shirt. Still that's better really, than that's really uh, bad. That's, that's, that's really a great bad. squat and deadlift. Yeah. But the bench is horrible. And what town had the best groupies for wrestling in your experience? Portland had great groupies. Portland was awesome for that. Like, cause you are in the same town every week, you know, the same shows like three or four nights a week. You're in the same town every week. 
And so, uh, and then yeah, there were spot show towns, you know, because you're on the road six nights a week. It was awesome for for that. Marty Janetti mentioned to me that he had been with approximately five thousand women. I'm sure. Uh, what were you? What would you estimate your numbers to be at? I stopped counting at a hundred, and that was in 1984 <laughs> or something. 1980. Wait, when was it? 1987. I, I stopped counting at a hundred. Like, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to keep a record any longer. And plus it was a, you know, I didn't want to, it got ridiculous. I figured it, you know, so yeah. So I think it was, I I think I just graduated college and I hit a hundred women. I guess you and Marty would have been quite a pair on the road. Yeah, totally. Uh, he was so much fun to be around. He was, man, that guy, he was a chick magnet. Oh my God. Did you ever experience any of his ribs? No, he never ribbed me. We are. Oh, I mean, maybe, I, maybe this might be considered a rib. Like sometimes he would leave his, the women he picked up. He'd leave them on my doorstep in the morning, like he and 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 then uh and try and get me to give him a ride home. But uh, yes. yeah. But I, but I don't think I ever did though. <laughs> and just back to Sunny for a minute. I just realized there was a fan question on her. What were your thoughts on uh, her relationship with Chris Candido? Ah, it was a strange couple, you know. I mean, you know, all the cheating she did on him. I don't know if he was okay with it or not. Um, you know, let's let's just say that I hope he was, you know. <laughs> and for the Montreal screw job, you had a few fans that wanted me to ask your opinion on that. Some people feel it was the greatest work in wrestling history. Any possibility on that? Yeah, I don't think it was a work. I think it was a real. I mean, like uh yeah, I just don't the way everything played out. I just don't, you know, and and, and I was one of the first. I've maybe have been the first worker to to realize the Pillman thing was a work, you know. So I'm a, you know, like right away when Pillman did that thing, he did something, and I go and I remember Disco going to me, "Wow, did you see what Pillman did?" I go, "It's a work." He goes, "No," I go, "They wouldn't show him on camera," you know, right away. So I mean, I right away. So I'm pretty good at sussing that out. But I would think that that's a shoot though, the uh, the Bret Hart thing, because there's. There's too many things that were st- that you that would have just not fallen the right fallen the way they did, or it, it would just it would have been too detrimental for both to even take that chance. I think. And I understand at one point you were booking for for Billy Corgan back when he had an independent company, I think based in Chicago. They've recently lost their uh, their executive producer due to all these speaking out allegations. Could you see yourself working for Billy Corgan again in the future? They could probably really use a mind like yours and you live in Atlanta. Well, I didn't book for Billy before. I was just, uh, I worked with him in the office. Um, like, uh, I was like, I was like his assistant, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, Billy get along really well, but I, I think Billy's shutting it down is from what I hear. so i don't um yeah i I, plus billy likes to billy wants to the only the the thing is is billy really does the booking billy does all the booking as far as at least he did it with resistance pro um uh he he liked me there to have my wrestling mind so i could say yay or nay to ideas you know like if they make sense if they don't you know but ultimately he was the final say on everything as he should have been you know but um yeah i don't know I don't think I heard from what I from the grapevine. I heard that Billy's not opening it back up. He's really disillusioned. Well, really, they only had a YouTube show, and as you know, you can't fund an entire wrestling company based on two hundred thousand YouTube views a month. Yeah, um, but it was actually they were starting to make a profit, though. Believe it or not, the the way they had it budgeted, and and it was all I think in. I think uh, that I'm not saying anything out of turn, but I think it was all part of a plan to to go bigger with it. But it was just as uh, as a, it was a it was basically that was his stepping stone to getting a TV deal, you know, and uh, and that's what he was working towards, from what I gather. Is it true you dated Trish Stratus back in 1999? Never. never. Interesting. No, I, I would never lie about women I've been with. What about Sonny? Were you were you with her? No, no comment. Okay. And for all the wrestlers watching this, I was I was a heel when I wrestled. I always like to know uh, 
your opinion on what makes a great heel? Um, he has to get frustrated. So, like, the most people, like, in the, the way the match is set up is the p- way people are taught. It's the baby face shines, the heel gets heat, and the baby face makes a comeback. What I've decided in my is what I think is more important is not the baby face shines, but the heel gets frustrated. Then the heel gets heat because he cheats to get the heat and they make baby face makes a comeback. And it's because if the heel doesn't get frustrated, he has no reason to cheat. And that's really the crux of every match is the heel cheats, he gets the advantage, and then the baby face has to make a comeback. And that's what makes wrestling so exciting because the baby face always has to make a comeback. But if the heel doesn't get frustrated in the beginning, then what's he going to, why is he cheating? You know, just while well, he cheats anyway. Well, yeah, but it's more exciting if he has a, if he has a reason to cheat. And so I think that's part of it. I think if, if he has a point of view, I think the best heels always have a point of view, but it's either skewed or like, like Bret Hart, when he was said, I should be a hero. You people should love me. I should be a hero. And he had a point of view. He, he did have a good point, except that if he was a real hero, he would have walked off into the sunset. He wouldn't have complained that he didn't, that he wasn't getting, that he should have been a hero. Right. Yeah. So he had a point of view, which is what made him so good. It was brilliant. as a, It was amazing as a heel. Um, you know, so I think you have a point of view. I think if you're, I think it's also important as a heel not to be funny, unless you're going to be mean funny. Like Jim Cornette was funny, hilarious. So you liked him. Paul Lee was mean funny. So you didn't like him. You know what I mean? Because if you're too funny as a heel, people are going to like you because heel, because comedy being funny is likable. So I think you have to, you have to be, you know, I think that's important to just to, to not be to not be likable whatsoever, you know. But I think you're also, if you're a really good heel, 10% of the audience is always gonna love you no matter what. And there's nothing you can do about that. But when it gets over 10 or 15%, you have to know how to show your ass to um, you know, to uh to turn the tide and get the people back to hating you again. You know, like when the when the rock was the people's was the corporate champion. First, I mean, at first he was like, they started making him the people's champion as he was still a heel. And then just as he was about to turn the corner and become a super baby face, he switched and went back to being a heel as as the corporate champion. And it was such a, like, he showed his ass so perfectly because it was all about the money to him, not the fans. And that was what made people really hate him. Like, because they were starting to like him too much. And it was brilliantly done. That was some brilliant ass booking. And for people that want to get more of your opinions and stories, you have the Raven Effect podcast. podcast. Where can people subscribe to that? Pretty much everywhere, except I don't think we're, except I think Spotify doesn't carry us for some reason. Or they, they always have, all they have is reruns or something. I don't know, something weird with Spotify. Like they've been, they've gone there, but it's MLW. It's the Raven Effect podcast. We're wrestling adjacent because we don't talk about much wrestling. Um, because uh, you can talk, talk about wrestling anywhere. You know, I think, I think I'm pretty funny and I have a, a, a skewed point of view that's pretty entertaining. And uh, so it's always, I think it's a fun listen. It's a good hour. Um, you know, it's entertaining. And, uh, and if you don't like it, then, uh, well, then you have bad taste. And you're on uh, social media as well. Where could people look you up on there? Yeah, basically, I just do Twitter. Instagram's too much of a pain in the ass. Facebook, I'm only on because I post on Twitter and it also posts on Facebook. But uh, but uh, the Raven Effect at the Raven Effect, and basically this is consists of my Twitter career. Is I put up a I find pictures like really good art pictures like photographs, and then I and then I caption them and I try and make it funny captions and that's what I <laughs> do do like one a, one a day, and then I respond back to the to the people who uh, you know who like or dislike or have something to say, you know, but, um, yeah, but basically it's, uh, I'm a sloth. I'm pretty lazy. Hey, so, um, uh, before we, uh, I never mind. I, I'll wait till you, I'll wait till we're finished. I'd ask, I, I'd ask you. We're pretty much almost done. I just have one question since you brought up MLW, you're part of their radio network. Any chance uh, of seeing you pop up there? Yeah. You never know. Um, uh, we we definitely talked about it, but you know the coronavirus screwed everything up. You know, so the um, but yeah, Court Bauer's a really good guy. Um, I like Court. I really like him a lot, and also I like that he gives me credit too. Like, you know, like um, you know, for having some uh, input into his uh, for you know giving him some in, in insight into the business. Like, 
to me, it always like it seems like people never want to admit that people like you know when people help them. Like to me, it's like I think it shows more uh, more like because they think it shows weakness if if you learn if you had help. But uh, I think it shows strength, you know, that you put people over, you know, that you uh, that you have respect for that. So, like, you know, like uh, if I if it wasn't for the grappler, I never would be half the talent I am. I mean, he he didn't he let me pick his brain every night. Like I I rode for for two years basically. Like uh, I rode I, I rode with him probably for like the first year and a half a year or so. Um, and I was the green kid, so I always had to drive. But hey, that's fair because that's the green guys always got to drive. And uh, but we'd always drive his truck, so he put the miles on his truck, not on my car. And um, and uh, and he wouldn't necessarily go out of his way to teach me, but but if I wanted, but anything I wanted to learn, if I could pick his brain, he would he would teach me. Like so, like one day, and so one day we're riding, I'm like, I want to be in a cage match, and he's like, you know, because a cage match looks cool, you know what I mean? I don't even work in a year and a half, you know. And he goes, Well, what are you going to do the week before? I go, I don't know. He goes, We'll figure it out. So I was like, all right, what if we do this in my angle? And then I know we have a cage match. He goes, and he goes, yeah, but what are you going to do the week after? I don't know. Figure it out. And so he taught me like through that kind of teaching, how to book, how to understand psychology, how to like everything, you know, and he was there, man. He just, I got so much out of him. And, and, and that's a really good autobiography. If you ever want to read one, read his autobiography. It's fascinating. It's the grappler. It's, and it's Lynn Denton, not Len. Everybody thinks it's L-E-N, but it's actually a girl's name, Lynn, L-Y-N-N. -N. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, he was, people don't realize it because it was territorial, but he was only 19 or 20 years old and he was working on top for Watts. And for what, and Watts made him a wrestling character, you know, the grappler. And he only weighed like probably 220 at the time. He's like 5'10". And Watts was all about big guys. So to put a guy with a mask on, on top at that size for Watts. And he, uh, and he worked on top in the Superdome with the junkyard dog. You know, he had like all in one angle they had, he was blinded walking with a cane and yet he had all the belts <laughs> <sighs> and, uh, and man, but, uh, and, and then there's a whole reason why his career, you know, didn't stay on the same level as it did. And, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting. It's a really interesting book. If you like wrestling, you know, which I obviously anybody watching this likes wrestling. So I highly recommend it. And there was something uh, you wanted to say before we close off here. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, so what uh, what was the deal with you and Abdullah? I always heard about that, but. Oh, uh, do you not well, want to talk about it now? Or you want to talk about it off the air? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, people know the story, but basically uh, he had a match with me where I was supposed to bleed, he was supposed to bleed. But it turns out that he had had hep C for at least 10 years before he wrestled me. But he was never supposed to, to cut me in that match. And he took it upon himself to cut me, even though I was already bleeding from my own cuts, with the same razor blade oh. he used on himself. Which is why when I found out I had hep C through when I got signed by WWE, the medical tests, uh, we ended up getting his blood work, finding out he had the history of it, going to court over it. We won in Canada and the U.S., but unfortunately there was a two-year delay in getting the lawsuit endorsed in the U.S., and in that time he shut down his main restaurant and transferred property, so... We never actually saw anything out of it, but he was found guilty of negligence, assault, and battery out of this situation. Wow, I, I know that is that is almost word for word what I heard. So I guess I did hear the right story. But I, I always felt so bad for you for that. Like I always had my sympathies because that's just some bullshit, you know. Yeah, it sucks because you finally make it, and that is like, oh, you, you're not getting the contract. And by the way, you now have to fight this disease. And the, fir the first treatment didn't work either. So I had to actually pay 80 grand for the second one that did work. But at least I got cured. Oh, thank God. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you if you got cured by it, uh, of it. Yeah, it took, it took about five years, but I thank God I got cured. Yeah, congratulations on that, at least. So the, uh, what is, how bad was the hep C? Like, I mean... 
did you did you suffer badly because of it or were you able to get cured before you suffered from it uh luckily well i did uh, have some liver damage from it but luckily the worst part was well not luckily was the treatment because at that time the treatments were very harsh uh -oh. so that was the worst part you had like bug under the skin itching and 45 pound weight loss is it was very similar to chemotherapy so that was actually the toughest you were and you were like a state level champion wrestler too or, or and a national, right national, 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 level, national level right the national level yeah did you ever think about going after abdullah or in that fight yeah what am i gonna do he's in a wheelchair oh is he i don't know that's what i'm saying i don't know yeah that's i i was always curious um like, cause that's all I known about you other than dreamer put you over to me, you know, cause I think dreamer did a match with you where he tapped to you. I think we did like some weird angle in the match and people thought that, uh, it was a shoot finish. Right. Right. Something like that. Yeah, cause dreamer yeah. dreamers big thing is that he never taps out. Like if it was, if it was a shoot, I'd never tap out. Yeah. And so, and, and, so, like, you know how Dreamer believes his own wrestling character, like, he acts like he does, but but he really kind of does. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that he that he tapped to you, I was like, wow, that speaks volumes for you, because Dreamer doesn't want to tap to anybody. Thank you. So, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap this up to the fans? Yeah, um, I just want to say that, uh, that um, I'm loyal, I'm grateful that you've been so loyal all these years, you know? I mean, you know, that's the other, that's the, we started out talking about the fans in the beginning. That's the other thing I, that I want to say about the fans is, is the, is part of the problem with the boys is they don't realize, or at least they didn't, that if it wasn't for the fans, we would have no income. You know, they're the ones paying for our living. So, you know, when, when you, when you talk down to the fans or, you know, as they're just a bunch of dumb marks, you're, you're just doing them a disservice, you know, I, and I really, and I'm really grateful that I've had such loyal fans all these years, you know, I'm really, really lucky to have the fans I have. Um, cause they've been, they've always stood behind me and they always, um, they've always supported me, you know, and I've done really well and I'm very lucky and very grateful to have the career I had. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.